Hi everyone, my name is Zarifa Baroud and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter's European Center for Palestine Studies. And I'm also the Digital Media Associate for American Muslims for Palestine and I'm gonna be the moderator for this event today. I first off want to start by thanking the amazing UW MSA for hosting this event entitled Centering Palestine, Narratives Challenging Injustice. And we have two incredible speakers, very prestigious speakers, to be giving their input today. First off, I was just asked to give a little bit of an introduction, maybe kind of an, a historical overview of what we're seeing today. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are here for the same reason. You know, over the last seven months, we've witnessed before our eyes an unfolding genocide in Gaza. Over 42,500 have been killed, including those missing and presumed dead underneath the rubble. And we've seen this firsthand with bodies being pulled out of the rubble on Instagram. Over 79,200 have been injured. We've seen children have their limbs amputated on hospital floors without anesthesia and things of that nature. Much of Gaza has been flattened in the last seven months and systematically destroyed, including hundreds of homes, hundreds of thousands of homes, sorry, civilian infrastructure, such as water desalination plants, leading to um, no clean water, electricity outages, uh, hospitals being destroyed, schools, shelters, and refugee camps as well. However, this is maybe something that you've heard, but perhaps not in mainstream media or the places that you need to be hearing it, but Israel's genocide and attack on the Palestinian people did not start on October 7th, nor did it start because of October 7th. In fact, historians, including the prominent Dr. Ilan Pape, have described Israel's policy against the Palestinian people, particularly in Gaza, as incremental genocide. This was far before 2023. Also, as we discuss the subject of narratives, in regards to Palestine today, we cannot remove what we are witnessing outside of its appropriate context. In just a week, we will be, commem we will be commemorating the 76th anniversary of the Nakba. The Nakba was Israel's foundational ethnic cleansing campaign that began in 1947, uh, which saw that 75% of historic Palestine's residents were forcibly displaced with 530 villages, towns, and cities, like my ancestral village, depopulated to make room for what is now the state of Israel. In regards to Gaza, 80% of Gaza's residents are refugees from that Zionist ethnic cleansing campaign in 1947 to 1949, and continue to be a primary victim of Israel's ongoing Nakba. Now, I was asked to briefly talk about what was Palestine before Israel was established. Of course, Palestine had a flourishing culture, um, beautiful towns and cities and villages that all had their unique attributes. For example, each different village or uh, region in Palestine can be traced back to a certain kind of tatris or embroidery pattern on women's clothing. However, I, I can't stand here and say, before Israel was established, everything in Palestine was fine. People were so happy and there was so much peace. There wasn't, there was absolutely not peace. And when we remove that context, we can't understand the nature of the settler colonial state that we see today. Um, for around 30 years before Israel was established, the colonial British mandate in Palestine was setting, state, setting the stage for what we know of as Israel today. This colonial oppression, like during the Great Revolt in the 30s, disabled Palestinians and guaranteed the success of Israel's Nakba and founding atop Palestine's ruins. While this is incredibly tragic that they've had to endure decades upon decades of colonial and settler colonial oppression and subjugation, these experiences have equipped the Palestinian people with the tools and culture to resist so effectively, even amid the most horrific realities like what we see in Gaza today. 
So I hope that that kind of sets the stage for maybe some of the subjects that will be talked about today. But first, I would like to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Miko Paled, who was born in Jerusalem to a Zionist family and eventually turned into a human rights activist and an author. You can grab his book over here, and I highly recommend that you do, The General's Son. Uh, he's also the recent founder and chair of the Palestine House of Freedom. So I, everyone, please give him a warm round of applause. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nice to see everybody. This is incredible. And I want to once again give an applause to MSA at, uh, over here that did such a great job setting this up. Let's give him a hand one more time. <laughs> I say this every time I speak at an event for, that's organized by uh, students on campuses, every single time. And it can't be overstated. The work that students, MSA students, SJP students, and others have been doing on campuses for years now has changed, elevated, I should say, the conversation of Palestine above and beyond what anybody else has done and above and beyond what we could have possibly imagined. The work that you guys do on campuses out, is the most important work being done for Palestine, for the liberation of Palestine, outside of Palestine. Nobody even comes close. Nobody even comes close. And this is before the encampments. This is before the encampments. This is before we've been seeing this enormous out output of courage and humanity in the encampments. It is absolutely heartwarming, it's encouraging, it's hopeful, it's optimistic. And on top of all of that, it's effective. It's effective, it has a history. We know that it's effective. I was at Columbia last week, and not all of them knew this, but many of the students do, was that in the 80s, it was an encampment like that that drove that campus to eventually divest from apartheid South Africa. And so when Palestine is free, as it will be, and I believe much sooner than most people think, you guys will be able to look at yourself in the mirror, tell your kids, tell your grandkids, tell everybody you know that you had a hand in this monumentally important historic development of the freedom and liberation of Palestine. So once again, I want you to take a moment and internalize that. The work that you are doing is absolutely above and beyond. And it is effective. And you are going to see the results. You're going to see, we're all going to see, we're all going to see the result. Oh. You're all going to see the results of your incredible work. Um, I mentioned I was at Columbia last week. I live in D.C. and there's an encampment at uh, George Washington University. I've seen the encampment here today and it's, it's almost exactly the same. This incredible display of humanity, this incredible display of courage, this incredible display of sumud, of standing and not being willing to move, not budging demanding the, the right thing and then standing up for the right thing and not being afraid of anything. You see the same thing everywhere, but it's done with a kind of sensibility, a kind of dignity that is unique. And again, it's unique, but it's, it's shared among all the ones that I've seen. I'm gonna be in San Diego in a couple of days. There's an encampment at university, uh, at UCSD as well. And I expect it'll be similar. And as we stepped out, so when I went to Columbia, the campus was already closed. You couldn't enter unless you had a faculty, you were faculty or student. But we managed to somehow smuggle. I mean, <laughs> not to brag, but I entered Gaza through a tunnel. So Columbia University, <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that. So Columbia University has got, so, you know, a uh, long ways to go. But um, <laughs> 
the, um, as we stepped outside, you know, we spent some time there and talked, and they're very sweet. They asked me to say a few words. And, um, and the video of that has gone crazy. I don't know, hundreds of thousands. It's just, a few, you know, it's, it's very, you know, it was very nice. But as we stepped outside, there was a counter protest. The Israelis, the Zionists were there. And it was just, so you, all, all the gates of the, of the campus are shut. So you have to find a gate that's open, and then you walk through a checkpoint. If anybody here has been to Palestine or heard what a checkpoint is, you kind of walk through this little walkway that the police set, set up. And then, of course, you walk, and they're right there, hundreds of them. And as soon as they see the kufiya, as soon as you see that you stepped out from that, the rage, the hate, the profanity, it's hard to believe that these people and these people are all this made from the same, you know, human species. One side is kind and organized and polite and maintains dignity, and the other side is wild and violent and rude. But that's exactly what is happening in Palestine. It's exactly, exactly indicative of what we see in Palestine. Now, you know, we have to talk about October 7, and, you know, People talk about it in lots of different ways. And I think it's important to talk about it honestly. There's this demand that I'm, everybody here has heard, I'm sure, whenever you open your mouth about Palestine, to condemn. Then you're allowed to say whatever you want to do. But first, condemn. I don't know. Um, what happened on October 7th? Fighters from the, one of the poorest and most oppressed areas in the world and most densely populated areas of the world came out. They came out on gliders. They came out on boats. They came out on foot. And they managed to paralyze the entire state of Israel. Paralyze it. Shut it down. For weeks and weeks, and, well, for months. Actually, the state of Israel has, will never recover. It hasn't recovered yet. It's in a total state of chaos. But the country was shut down. And it's interesting because during all the protests, and especially now in the encampments, one of the chants is, if we don't get it, shut it down. That's what they did. They shut it down. They managed to demonstrate and by the way, they did this exactly, exactly 50 years and one day after the beginning of the 73 October War, where we saw the exact same thing. Arab forces came in and caught the entire Israeli military apparatus you know, off guard. Of course, the Palestinians were far more effective, far more effective, even though they have less resources and were living under much harsher conditions. <clears throat> so they shut it down. The state of Israel prides itself in being this modern, developed, you know, democratic miracle. They call it a miracle. I mean, people seriously call it a miracle. People who don't believe in God or miracles call it a miracle. And particularly the military and the intelligence, right? When people think Israel, they think, oh, military, oh, intelligence, they're so good. Nothing. A paper tiger. A bunch of guys who are lucky if they get one meal a day and coming from a place where clean water is a luxury. This in Gaza is a luxury. A luxury, this. Those guys managed to shut it down. Managed to shut it down. And like I said, for weeks and weeks and weeks, the fighting was going on still inside the boundaries of 1948 Palestine before they were able to go back in. And then what do we see after that? We saw the typical behavior of a gangster that was humiliated. A gangster, a bully that's humiliated. What do they do? They find the weakest, most defenseless people they can find and they take it out on them. And that's exactly what they're doing, and that's what they've been doing, and that's what they continue to do. The cruel, sadistic murder of tens 
of thousands of people and the torture of close to two million people. The most sadistic, horrifying torture one can imagine with zero regard, complete disregard for any standard of humanity. So who is it exactly that we need to condemn? Excuse me? Who is it that we need to condemn? What kind of a crazy upside world, upside down world do we live in where the demand is to condemn the people who stood up and shut it down? And the praise and the sympathy and the empathy and the billions of dollars and the weapons go to the perpetrators of a particularly sadistic form of genocide. What kind of a crazy world do we live in where our elected officials, our elected officials, we voted for them, feel that they can take our money and fund and arm what is really nothing more than a glamorized terrorist organization, which is the State of Israel and its military wing, the Israeli army. What kind of a world do we live in where they feel they can do that? We vote for them. We pay the taxes. The Sixth Fleet works for us. Mm -hmm. The US Navy's Sixth Fleet works for us. Yep. It's in the Mediterranean. They should be providing humanitarian aid to the people in Gaza. They should be enforcing a blockade against Israel. They should be enforcing an arms embargo. They should be demanding and enforcing a no-fly zone over Gaza. Why aren't they doing that? They work for us. Why are they working for Israel? Are we crazy? Are we out of our minds? How are we letting this happen? How are we letting it happen? Our money, our representatives, our military, rather than stopping it, is not only allowing it to happen, but is participating willfully in this horrifically, like I said, sadistic form of genocide. And like Zarifa was saying, the genocide didn't start after October 7. And the whole conversation about genocide is really quite interesting. Genocide is a crime. It's a well-defined crime. It was defined in 1949 to a large degree as a result of the genocide of the Jews in Europe by the Nazis. It's a well-defined crime. You can read it. It's not a question of opinion. It's not a question of uh, do we feel about it? Do we feel it's genocidal? Do we not? But this is how the conversation is. Do you feel like it might be genocide? Is your opinion that it might be just read the law? It's very clear. It fits. It's genocide. They are murdering civilians for almost eight decades in a systemic way. Systematic erasure of a nation. Systematic erasure of a culture, a history, and a country. That is genocide. There's no opinion here. The law is clear. The evidence is clear. And yet, the money is coming from us. The weapons are coming from us. The support is coming from us. And rather than condemning that, we're asked to condemn the Palestinians, the victims of this. Not the Palestinians are victims. I don't like to use that term. Palestinians are heroes. They're not victims. But who is it that we're trying to, that, that we're supposed to condemn and why? And there's, there's a lot of similarities to what we're seeing now on campuses. You see the politicians come out. You see the university administrators and presidents come out. Why are they not standing with the students? Why are they not standing with the students? How can they justify to themselves not standing with the students? The students are demanding that their campuses divest from that war machine, that genocide machine. 
And who are the administrators and the politicians condemning? The students. Who are the police beating up? The students. Who's being arrested and punished and suspended? The students. Once again, we're out of our minds. And we're allowing this to happen? These administrators have a right to suspend these heroes? These encampments will be remembered as one of the greatest moments in the history of these campuses. Your names will be remembered. They'll be put on. Your names will be heralded everywhere for this heroic gesture. Never mind the fact that you'll know that you participated in this great struggle and won, because I have no doubt that you're going to win. But these administrators, these politicians, never mind the fact they're not thinking about their own legacy. Who wants to be remembered as the person who had the power, who had the authority, but supported the genocide? And now, once again, they're talking about inviting the head of the apartheid state, the man who stands at the head of this sadistic, brutal genocide in Gaza, to come and speak in Congress. They talked about it, uh, Mike Johnson talked about it a while ago, it was kind of shut down, and now they're talking about it again. And you know, if, you listen, if you've been following me, if you ever listen to the things I say, I never make comparisons between Israel and Zionism and the Nazis. But can you imagine inviting Hitler to speak in front of a joint session of Congress while the Holocaust was going on? Can anybody imagine asking Hitler for a ceasefire while the Holocaust was going on? as the people were being murdered and burned, millions of them, asking Hitler to agree to the terms of the ceasefire and taking his time. There's no rush. Kill away. Because that's what we're doing now with, 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 with the state of Israel. That's exactly what we're doing now. And in the 30s and 40s, there was no social media. We didn't see the, the, the nobody saw the images until many, many decades later. We see this on prime time. This is happening in broad daylight. They're not even embarrassed. The numbers that Zarifa mentioned earlier of the dead and the wounded, they carry it as a badge of honor. To them, this is the accomplishment. People talk about, well, you know, Israel, you know, they haven't really reached their, 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 their goal. They haven't done this. What do you mean they haven't reached their goal? Their goal was to murder as many Palestinians as possible. That was their goal. These numbers are precisely what they're proud of. That's what we're dealing with. They haven't reached their goal? Of course they've reached their goal. I mean, they would do more, and they are doing more, except that because it's not thousands being killed every day, but maybe only 50. I don't know if you've had a chance to hear, there have been some uh, really heroic uh, medical teams that have gone into Gaza and come back over the year, over the over the last few months, and I've had the opportunity to hear a couple of presentations, and I interviewed a nurse and a doctor. And you know, the worst part of what is happening in Palestine is not the bombing. The worst part are the small details, the daily stuff. You know, so I have a good friend, for example. Isa Amr, who some of you may know from, from Al Khalil, from, from Hebron. And I was in Jordan uh, just a few weeks ago, and he came across, and we met there, we talked. And, you know, I'm in touch with him all the time. We've been friends, and we've been working together for a very long time. By the way, the New York Times did a piece about him. You should, you should check it out. Just a couple of days ago, the New York Times did a huge piece on him. And um, to hear just how severe the reality is in Hebron, for example, which wasn't exactly paradise for Palestinians before October 7, to hear him describe the day that he was arrested that day. It's the details that are so horrifying. It's how the soldiers laughed when they were torturing him. It's the details. In Gaza, 
Like I said, it's not the bombing. It's the fact that a nurse, like this nurse, her name is Nurse Lana. She goes by Nurse Lana. Uh, you can ch she's all over social media. She's doing interviews. And she's saying, you know, as a nurse, she's used to, uh, at the end of a treatment, to give a patient's uh, discharge instructions. And what are the discharge instructions? You go home, you drink plenty of water, you clean the wound with clean water, you put new bandages on. And she describes how as she was beginning to say this, she realized there's no home. They're not going home. They're out there in the street. If they're lucky, they have a, they have a tent made of, uh, I don't know, big plastic sheets. This is a luxury. They don't have it. There is no clean water to wash the wound. There's no antibiotic to put on a kid's scratch, so the kids are getting infections and dying from infections that they get from scratches because they're barefoot. There's no ointment. There's no bandages. And she describes that moment where she was going to give the instructions and suddenly caught herself. That's the worst of it. Kids dying from a scratch. You know, we have kids, I know, you know, I'm a father. I've, you know, they have a scratch, they cry, you put a little Band-Aid on it with uh, Mickey Mouse or something, and they kiss it and they go away, and it's done. You don't worry about it. But you know what the worst detail is? It, it, it gets even worse. You take the Gaza Strip, and I'm sure I don't have to describe the geography to anybody here. You take the Gaza Strip, and you drive east for 10 minutes, any point in the Gaza Strip. You drive east for 10 minutes. You have the best medical facilities. All the clean water you could, probably, you could possibly need. All the food you could possibly need. 10 minutes. So, at, at most, some places even less. So the Gaza Strip, the notion that airdropping aid is a good idea. The notion that thousands, thousands of trucks with millions of dollars worth of humanitarian aid that's being rotting, by the way, need to be standing there. Now Biden wants to build a pier. All of that is part of the conversation. Forcing Israel to open the gates doesn't even come up in the conversation. Open the goddamn gates. Break down the wall. Let people go. Free Gaza. Why is that not part of the conversation? How is that not a demand that's being made in Congress, in the Senate, in every, in every uh, city council, in every state legislature? Open the gates and let people go. There's no reason for any of this. There's no justification for any of this. It's pure and simple sadistic genocide, a cruelty. I don't even know how to describe it. It's a cruelty that the mind cannot grasp. And it's being done on our watch. It's being done on our watch. But that should be the conversation. Ceasefire, negotiate with Israel. Never mind, Israel has a history of 75 years of ceasefire agreements that have been violated. From, 19, for, from uh, February 1949, when Israel signed the first agreements, armistice agreements, with the countries surrounding Palestine, and suddenly there was no more Palestine, from that moment, The ink was barely dry on the paper when they already violated these agreements, where they had military incursions into Gaza, into the West Bank, into Lebanon, into Syria. And there's a history of 76 years of this. And now we need to ask for another one that we know is going to violate at the, after we've seen the, these piles of bodies. We have to control this conversation. We have to take it in a, more, in a, in a, in a sane direction. Israel needs to open the gates. The siege of Gaza needs to be lifted. People should be allowed to go home. Israel needs to pay to rehabilitate Gaza, rehabilitate the people. And we need to demand this because it's not going to happen on its own. We have to demand this. And that's like, oh, 
Oh, sorry. It's sorry. totally okay. I'm sorry. 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 The, sorry. sorry. the, the light okay. was blinding everyone. Sorry, I'm sorry. Totally... That's exactly. Sorry about that. I talk like this. <laughs> sorry about that. But that's exactly what the encampments are doing. They're demanding this. That's exactly what the students are doing in the encampments. They're demanding this. They want their campuses to divest from this genocidal apartheid regime that has no legitimacy, that needs to be dismantled, that needs to make way for a free democratic Palestine from the river to the sea. And that's what they're doing. There's all this talk about, well, from the river to the sea, it's, it's, should we say that, shouldn't we say that, it's upsetting some people. There was at the encampment here, there's a beautiful poster, not very big, there's these two uh, beautiful um, red flowers, and it says from the river to the sea. The Zionists are going to take anything beautiful and destroy it. It doesn't matter what we say. We need to say what we mean. A free Palestine from the river to the sea is a beautiful idea. It's a beautiful idea. Nobody should take that away. Nobody has a right to take that away. It's a vision. It's a hopeful vision. It's a beautiful vision. It's a vision of freedom, of democracy, of liberty. Anybody who has a problem with that, they need to live with the problem. It's their problem. It's a beautiful vision, and we need to fight for it. We need to demand it. And we need to demand that that's what's put on the table. Not a goddamn ceasefire, a free Palestine. What are we talking about? Dismantling the apartheid regime unconditionally now. Releasing tens, over 10,000 Palestinians in Israeli jails now, unconditionally. They go to Qatar, and then they go to Cairo, and then they go here, and they negotiate. Negotiate with them? They don't deserve a seat at the table. They need to be defeated soundly once and for all. And the way we do it is precisely with what the students are demanding, divestment. Then we need to demand sanctions. Then we need to make sure that there's boycott of Israel everywhere across the board. And some of us are old enough to remember how it worked in South Africa. Yep. And by the way, you know, we all know Americans have received a very Zionist education. Americans don't even know if they're Zionists, but they are, because they receive a Zionist education. When people ask me, where are you from? I say Palestine. And half the time, people will say, Pakistan? <laughs> And then the other half, who have heard of a Palestine, they're like confused. Because people don't know. But if I say Israel, oh, of course, we love, oh, we love Israel. Oh, Israel, of course, of course, we love Israel. Americans receive a, Zion, a very strong, a very effective Zionist education. That's why we're in this place to begin with. So it's not like... It happens because there are lobbyists in Washington, D.C. I mean, they're there just to make sure that the education works properly. But they're already Zionists when they go there. They're already Zionists. They know about the Holocaust. They know about the Bible. They know about all, this, all these different things. They know exactly where Zionism is, wants them to be, and that's where they stand. So we come up and we say, we want sanctions, and we want boycott against the state of Israel. And what do they say? You've got to be anti-Semitic. The only Jewish state in the world, and you want to boycott them? You've got to be anti-Semitic. There's no context. They never learned about the, all this other stuff. When Amnesty International came out with their uh, apartheid report more than two years ago, I'm afraid to ask. I ask this question, and, and, I, and I'm usually disappointed by the answer, because people haven't read it, never mind shared it. You know, it, they, it fell in our lap like a gift like manna from heaven, and it's sitting in a drawer somewhere. That is the context we needed in the recommendations. Well, even without the recommendations, when you have an, a, a, a state that is guilty, that is executing the crime of apartheid, which, by the way, is also a very clearly defined crime. It's not an opinion. It's not a thought. 
Just because there may be an Arab, a Palestinian sitting next to a Jew in a bus doesn't mean it's not apartheid. That's not the standard. And it's in the report. That's the context. It's an apartheid state, which means there need to be sanctions. It's very simple. It's engaged in genocide. Look at the law. Read it. Look at what Israel is doing. Everybody knows what they're doing. It's not, they're not doing it in secret. It's genocide. That means sanctions. Severe sanctions. That means a weapons embargo. There are actions that are known that need to be taken when these crimes are committed. But Israel gets a pass. Why? Maybe because they're killing Palestinians and nobody cares. It's the only explanation I can think of. And of course, the Zionist education helps. So I think clarity is very often missing from the conversation. Never mind humanity, but certainly clarity. Genocide is not an opinion. Apartheid is not an opinion. Ethnic cleansing is not an opinion. The way we respond to these things is said in law. It's not an opinion. It's very clear. The people we vote for owe us their job. The money they use is our taxes. The Sixth Fleet works for us, supposed to work for us. It's actually quite simple when you think about it. What's missing is us stepping up. And I think in many people's minds, there's this idea that one day there will be Salah Hadin who will come and liberate Palestine. Well, look around you, folks. This is Salah Hadin right here. This is Salah Hadin right here. And go out to the encampment. You'll see Salah Hadin there. This is it. This is it. The claim that we hear a lot is, well, you know, they don't listen to us. They're all paid off by the Zionists. It doesn't matter what we do, which is true. I mean, there could be a million people in the street. I mean, in fact, some of us, again, are old enough to remember just what, maybe a month or so before the, uh, the Iraq war. Again, it's one of these uh, laundry machine, uh, words that went through a laundry machine. This, this genocidal assault on Iraq that took place by the United States, by George Bush, just a month or so before it began, there was one of the largest, if not the largest, anti-war protests ever. Yep. And a month later, they started the attack on Iraq. They're not listening to us. So we need to step up. That's what I believe. We need to step up. We need to figure out a way how we get into these boardrooms, how we get into the offices of these members of Congress. And it's not only Congress. It's local politicians, too. School board members, city council members, mayors, chiefs of police, and on and on and on. Start a divestment campaign in your city, in your town. We're thinking of doing the back, you know, in DC. I mean, this is, this is the, we have a model already because of South Africa. We need to step up. If they're not listening to us, we need to step up. We need to make sure that we are in there. And we can learn a lot from what the Zionists have been doing. Granted, the Zionists have been doing this for 100 years. That's why they're so effective. And they've got unlimited resources. We don't have 100 years, and we have very limited resources. So we have to be quick and smart and use guerrilla warfare to get in there. But we have to get in there. There's only one solution. Excuse me if this sounds uh, you know, radical. But I can only see one solution to ending the genocide of the Palestinian people. Dismantling the power that is committing the genocide. Is there something else out there? No. no. You dismantle the apartheid state, again, through sanctions, uh, arms embargo, and all the other things I mentioned, and you replace it with a free democratic Palestine from the river to the sea on all of historic <laughs> Palestine. Why do we need to apologize? Why do we need to apologize? Because they, it hurts their feelings? I want them to be ashamed. They're supporting genocide. We have to worry about them feeling ashamed and uh, not included or whatever the hell it is that they can. I don't want them included. Anybody who supports genocide does not get a seat at the table. This is not a matter of negotiations. This has to be forced upon them. 
People also forget, you know, apartheid in South Africa didn't fall because white people in South Africa woke up in a good mood one day. It's not exactly what happened. They woke up one day, they couldn't travel, they couldn't import, they couldn't export, they were on their knees, it was over. That was it, it was over. And that's where this genocidal apartheid regime that has been tearing Palestine apart for 76 years, that's where that regime needs to be, on their knees. Nothing less than that. On their knees. There can be zero compromise. There can be zero compromise when you have a history of 76 years, almost 80 years, of committing genocide. There's no room for compromise anymore. There's no room for negotiations. God knows Palestinians have tried for decades. And Palestinians are doing everything they can. I mean, Palestinians are living in a maximum security prison. How much can they do? They move one way, they move another way, they're going to get killed. If they stand up, they get killed. If they, if they fight, they get killed. If they're in their beds with their children, they get killed. And their children get killed. We are the ones that have to step up. We are the ones that have to step up. And everybody in this room is intelligent enough and courageous enough to do what needs to be done. Yep. Everyone in this room and beyond. We just have to do it. We just have to demand it. Now, um, about a, a few years ago, as I was driving through DC, I live in DC, you know, in DC there's a lot of uh, embassies and cultural centers and military attaches and all kinds of international stuff going on. And you see every flag under the sun. Almost. Almost. Which flag is missing? Not for long. Not for long. And let me tell you why. And so I got together with a few friends, Palestinian friends in Palestine, friends in the US, friends in DC. And we decided to establish what we call the Palestine House of Freedom, or Dar al Hurriya. And over the last year or so, we've worked extremely hard, raising a little bit of money, getting some awareness, putting together like an institution or an actual organization, 501c3, all that kind of stuff, all that good stuff. And a couple of months ago, I met with this um, very generous Palestinian businessman who owns properties in DC. And he said, come, I want to show you something. And he took me to this magnificent space, less than half a mile from the Capitol, on Pennsylvania Avenue. And he said, does this work? Wow, it doesn't even begin to describe the feeling. It's an amazing space. Amazing space. We had it painted. We're getting it. We're going to decorate it. We've got office. You know, we're putting it together. I'm already working out of there. We've got big plans for it. The Palestinian flag, we're waiting because we have to put in a security camera first because when they come to vandalize it, I want to see their picture. <laughs> so the sign and the flag are coming up. We're going to have a sign in the front. It's, we're on the street. We're on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's a, it's a beautiful part. You see the Capitol right there. Members of Congress have condos overlooking us. Um, but the idea is we have a massive, massive, about the ha size of the half of this floor flag that was gifted to us from friends in Hebron, sisters and brothers in Hebron, sewn by women in Hebron. And the idea is basically to take this, you know, we're seeing protests everywhere, right? The grassroots is incredible. It's exploding. The nonprofits, NGOs, everybody's doing a lot of fantastic work is being done. But there's this little bit that we're not reaching. So we decided we're going to focus on that. We're going to put our suit on. And we're going to focus on getting into the boardrooms and the halls of power at, in the Capitol, in the mainstream media, at the, using you know, the diplomatic corps, which is all over us, and to the public, of course, with two points and nothing else. Dismantling apartheid, establishing a free democratic Palestine from the river to the sea. That's it. That's it. It's 
It's not a relief organization. It's not a something else organization. God forbid it's not a dialogue or a peace organization. It is straightforward space for Palestinian interests. Dismantling apartheid and establishing a free democratic Palestine and making people understand that that is the path to peace. People, we don't even talk about peace anymore. God forbid the genocide is so horrifying. How could you even think about peace? But there's no other way to end the genocide. There's no other way to end the genocide. Waiting for Israel to get up in the morning one day and feel good about it. That's not how it works. We have to have a strategy. We have to have a professional team. We have to get into the halls of power. We have to use every means at our disposal to get the politics and the policy on Palestine to change in the US Capitol. Because that's where decisions are being made. I don't know if you guys saw, but a couple of weeks ago, you guys, know, everybody know who Roger Waters is? Yeah. If you don't, then you should. <laughs> anyway, Roger Waters, the great, you know, a great musician and a great man, put together about a two-minute video talking about Dara Horia and, and the whole thing and encouraging people. He, he was a big supporter, both financially and in other ways. So you know, he's kind of encouraging people to, to join him. Um, Yusuf Cat Stevens reached out. So I mean, the word is getting out, you know. Some of us old enough remember Yusuf Cat Stevens. Um, but the word is getting out, and the important thing is that the important thing is that we understand that there is a way to end this, and we have the power to end this. We just need to sit down and do it. You know, I've been talking, I've been giving lectures, writing articles, doing interviews, I have a podcast, I've been talking about, it doesn't work, it's not enough. I mean, it's important, but it's not enough. So I decided, and again, we have a really fantastic team, that it's time for action. It's time to do stuff. It's time to sit down and to figure out how we get into these spaces. And we have allies there. There are members of Congress who get it. There are lots of staffers, both in the White House and the State Department, people that are coming out, dissenters. I mean, there's, stuff, there's, there's people there. There are allies, but they're over there, we're over here, we're crying free, free Palestine, they're confused and don't know what to do, and we're just not bringing these forces together. And so that's our vision, that's our mission, that's what we're trying to do, and of course, everybody's welcome uh, to give advice and to send money or do whatever they want to do or participate. But the idea is that eventually, I was talking to somebody from South America. You know, imagine Dara Horia in London, Dara Horia in Paris, Dara Horia in Buenos Aires, in Santiago, and on and on and on. That's how it's got to work. There has to be centers. There have to be centers that put Palestine first, and that doesn't exist. Palestine first means, and again, uh, if I'm wrong, correct me. But Palestine first means freeing Palestine first, dismantling apartheid and creating a free democratic state. This is Palestine first. We have to do this. We have to put Palestinian lives first. Palestinians have been living a life of terror, a life of terror for almost eight decades. And again, many Palestinians in the room, I don't have to tell you this, but Palestinians have been living under a reign of terror, whether they are Palestinian Bedouin in the Naqab, whether they're Palestinians in the Galilee, whether they're in Yaffa or Lid, whether they're in Ramallah or Al-Khalil or Gaza or anywhere else in Jerusalem. The fact that they live under different, what Israel did is they created different bureaucracies, so there's a sense that these are all separate. They're not separate. They're all governed by the same apartheid regime. They're all suffering from the same genocidal policies with slight variations. But the life of, of, excuse me, the life of Palestinian Bedouin in Naqab, where Israeli settlements enjoy some of the highest standard of living among Israelis, and that's really high. We've got Palestinian Bedouin who are citizens of Israel, who for them too, for them too, by the way, this is a luxury that they often can't afford. A road is a luxury they cannot have. Access to medical care. And again, these are citizens of Israel, or if they live in Lid, or Jerusalem or anywhere else. So this is not just Gaza. This is not just this place or that place. A free Palestine has to be defined clearly 
What does it mean? What does it look like? And that's what we need to fight for. And again, my experience is, shows that a free Palestine means a dismantled apartheid, a post-apartheid state, a free democratic state, one, one person, one vote, from the river to the sea. The whole debate that still goes on sometimes, I, I don't engage in that debate anymore, but this debate that uh, talks about one state, two state, give me a break. You know, I was, I was at an event in D.C., a fundraiser, lots of fundraisers. I know some very, very generous, wealthy people, so politicians come and do fundraisers. And it's an opportunity because these are usually pretty small. And uh, one of them, who was actually quite progressive, came in and she said, I believe in the two-state solution. And everybody in the room said, what? <laughs> it was, everybody was so disappointed because she seemed so, you know, and she honestly didn't know what, it, what to say. She didn't know that, she didn't realize that the world is actually far, far beyond that. So of course, we walked up to her, we told her about, oh, the, the slide went off. To, we talked about Dar Horia and so on. And so now we're, st now we're starting to engage uh, with the politicians. But we have to step up and do this. And we have to be, like I said, clear. You know, people often ask me how I ended up doing this. Uh, there's a book <laughs> that explains it, but I'll give you the short version. Because I was born, I was born to a Zionist family in Jerusalem, and my father was a general in the Israeli army in 1967. So it's like having a god for a dad. In terms of you know being an Israeli, for Israelis, a general in general, a general in general, is a god. But of that particular generation, and um, and again, you know, the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. But the, they talk about the 1967 war as a war. I mean, there were armies that fought each other. But it was just a massive, brutal assault by Israel against its neighbors. That's really what it was. And he was one of the generals who planned it and orchestrated it and then executed it. So how do you go from, um, how do you go from being raised in that, you know, extremely, extremely zealot Zion. I mean, every conversation around the dinner table, every day, I'm not exaggerating, was about the state, the Jewish state, about Zionism, how we contribute, how we secure, how we do more. That was everything. Family gatherings, I had other members of my family who were major players in in pre-state, pre-1948, and then after 1948. Major players in, in the Zionist movement in the state of Israel. That's all everybody talked about. That's all anybody talked about. And of course, you know, as a little boy, people say, so are you gonna be a general like your daddy? You know, that's, that's, that was, the, that was and so I didn't read about it just in a textbook, although I did that as well, but that was every day and everywhere. And it's very interesting to have been there and realize just how insulated and how racist and how myopic it, that world is. You really believe that you are in this place called Israel. You really believe that. You, you actually think that that is the reality. Whereas once you do what I call the journey of an Israeli in Palestine, the journey out of that, it's like you're suddenly seeing these bubbles all over Palestine. And you're realizing you're in Palestine and you're living in these, in these areas that are completely artificial, completely disconnected. And I'll never forget, you know, the first time I came to this realization, we have friends here from San Diego who I've known for many years. You know, the first time I heard about Palestinians talking about 1948, it was like people were telling me that night is day and day is night. Night is day is day is night. I mean, the different, there couldn't be more, more, a, a bigger difference, a, you know, between what I knew, and I, and I thought I knew everything, because my family, you know, was there, you know, my parents were born there, and they fought in 1948, and so on and so on. And suddenly I'm hearing these people talk about massacres, and forced expulsions. I'm like, that can't be, we don't do that. We're the nice people, we're the good guys here, we're the victims. But we won because we're just smarter. We won because we're you know, more advanced because we're kind of European and that sort of thing. 
And then it came to, and then I realized it's really not likely that everybody around, all the Palestinians around, got together and, and invented the story. There was some kind of a conspiracy. That just didn't make sense. And then meeting Palestinians more and getting engaging more and so on is uh, that's the journey. You know, that's the journey of an Israeli and Palestine. And then you're horrified. You have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. Where's your loyalty? to this thing that you were raised on and you have a family and a history with, or humanity. That, those, that's really the choice, Zionism or humanity. There's, no, there's really no gray area here. It's that, it's that, it was that striking, it was that clear. And so thankfully I had enough resources within me to, to pick humanity. And you know, people say, oh, you must have sacrificed, and it must have been, oh, thank you. I say, oh, you must have sacrificed. It must have been so difficult. It was liberation. Nothing short of liberation. It was the most joyful liberation anybody can experience because you tear yourself away from, from, from this, this tradition of lies, this tradition of racism, this tradition of violence. And it's so embedded in you, and it's nice to, you know, extricate yourself from that. The problem is that the only way I don't know if it's the only way, but typically the things that force us to go from, you know, deep belief in something and force us to, you know, depart from that is something terrible. That's very often the case. In my case, it was uh, my sister's little girl was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem. And that's exactly the kind of thing that shakes you to a place where you have to re-examine you have to re-examine. You, you're not the same person the next day. You're just not the same person the next day. And, um, and what we tend to do, and because the horrors in Palestine are just never stop, they never end, you go from one to the other like this, you forget what happened yesterday because so, something so much, horrible, so much worse happened the next day. But what I like to do is to go back and say, so let's, let's just look at one instance. So, for example, that particular, that particular day, it was uh, September the 4th, 1997. Three young men, Palestinians, blew themselves up. And intending to kill and killing other people, including my sister's daughter. Wow, let's think about that for a minute, okay? Now, 1996, 97 were particularly, particularly bloody years. There was a lot going on, a lot of violence. But let's think about that for a minute. What kind of a horrible reality was created? Did we, uh, you know, as Israelis, create that something so horrible can happen, and then we gloss over it and move to the next one? Three young men, you know, people in this room are that age decide to take their own lives and the lives of other people. You know, you can't just get up the next day and, and you're, not, you're not the same person. So my, again, my good fortune was twofold. One was that I was able to wake up or come back here to the U.S. and then, and then decide to engage and find out more. The second part was that the Palestinian community in San Diego who I met, who were the first Palestinians I ever met, welcomed me with open arms, without accusations, with, a, with kind of a, gave me the space I needed to kind of walk through this process, which is a very painful process. And I'm ever, you know, I'll forever be grateful. I talk about, you know, many of them in, in the book. And Adira and Hassan are here too, so you're, they're part of that, part of that group. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's the problem, that that's what it takes. But it's, um, it's, it becomes too obvious. And then we go back to today, and once again, I'll end where I started, which is, who is it that we're asked to condemn again? You know, because it's all related. It all comes back from that. Why are we accepting that? Why are we accepting this reality that I came from as okay, as normal, as victims when they established this horrifying reality 
in Palestine and caused so much harm and so much suffering to Palestinian people. You know, and again, uh, you, you mentioned the you know, pre-1948 Palestine. You know this lie about they made the desert bloom. You know, it's funny, if you ever see, I had a chance to see uh, aerial photos that the British took in the, when they took Palestine, around 1920 uh, or so, of the Naqab in the south, which is supposedly a desert that the Israelis made bloom. All cultivated land, cultivated land. And then we know there were cities, there were towns. You know, in Arabic, they say, Akhaduha Mafrusha, right? Yeah. Those of you who speak Arabic, they, stole, they took it fully furnished. This lie that somehow Palestine was empty, you know, the people had money in the banks, that was stolen. People had cars, they were stolen. People had homes, they were stolen. People had furniture and books, that was stolen. There were cities and hospitals and buildings and schools and institutions. It was all stolen. Trillions of dollars worth of a country were stolen. They didn't, they didn't make the desert bloom. They took a country that was in full bloom and stole it. And, everybody, and this is when? This is three years after the end of the genocide of the Jews in Europe. They allowed the genocide of the Palestinian people to commence. The same people, the same nations that fought the Nazis now allowed this to happen. So I think we need to reclaim the history. I think we need to tell, tell the truth about the reality. I think we just stand with the students in these encampments. I think we need to be clear about our demands for dismantling apartheid and a free democratic Palestine with equal rights. And I know, I don't think anymore, but I know that it's within our power to make it happen and to make it happen soon. So let's do it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miko Palet, for your uh, insightful and for your insightful analysis, but also the personal stories that you provided. I'm sure were valuable for all of us. Thank you so much. How can people find the House of Freedom? Is there a social media page or something? Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, right here, right? Yeah. So, so we had a website. It was hacked. So we don't have a website right now. So now we're doing it smarter and we're getting it done more professionally. But we're gonna, there's going to be a, we have an Instagram page, so that's a step in the right direction. So please uh, follow us. It's Palestine House of Freedom. And that's the logo. Don't worry Palestine House of Freedom. Okay, great. So everyone will follow us. that's how, and we're going to be putting stuff out more and more and more so everybody's going to know. Uh, there's going to be stuff on my social media as well. But we are 501c3. If anybody can just talk to me about supporting it otherwise. Uh, you, know, you can message me on social media or come talk to me. Afterwards. Great, thank you so much. And please do go grab a copy of his book. Um, next, I am so happy to be introducing Dr. Karam Dana. Uh, Professor Dana was raised in Halil or Hebron, and he, were, us in Washington, are honored to have him as an incredible. Per incredible professor at the UW. He is the Allison McGregor Distinguished Professor of Excellence and Transformative Research at the University of Washington, and also the founding director of the American Muslim Research Institute. He will also be releasing a book later this year um, entitled To Stand with Palestine, Transnational Resistance and Political Evolution in the USA. So please, everyone, give a welcoming <laughs> round of applause. Good evening, everyone. Salaamu Alaikum. Masa al khair for those who speak Arabic. And um, I'm very delighted to be here. First and foremost, I would like to say that nothing makes you feel old than seeing your former student almost becoming a professor. So I want to I wanna give it up for Zarife Baroud, who's soon to be <laughs> Dr. Baroud. 
who I must say I've known since she was a toddler, but that's a different story. So um, I also would like to thank Miko Pellet for such a very powerful uh, talk that he's given us today. Um, it really represents um, uh, the, 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 the interesting transformation we're all noticing, uh, not only uh, with regards to how, how th things are changing, how P Palestine is seen, uh, but also I think how people are seeing justice, and it's really uh, quite admirable in my opinion. So thank you very much, Miko, for everything you said today, and we're very delighted to have you. And of course, I also would like to highlight the significance of uh, the student group that put this event together, which is a very powerful event in my opinion, uh, the Muslim Student Association. Thank you for such, um, uh, for, for doing this. Absolutely. And while we're at this, I also would like to thank the community um, of the Seattle area, the Muslim community, the Arab American community. I see a lot of faces here, so I'm very delighted to see all of you here. Um, and especially when student organizations are connecting to the community, in my opinion, this is where we actually begin to make change and really uh, move in the right direction, in my opinion. So I want to thank you all for coming today. This is a very important event, especially during the days uh, that we're facing and, and the challenges that, that the University of Washington is facing, uh, obviously. Um, before I move into my talk, and the interesting thing is that I said, what should I talk about? And they said, anything you want, which is great. But also be careful, because I can talk and talk and talk. A lot of you know this, right? Um, but a, a few things I would like to highlight today. Uh, before I move forward, I want to uh, introduce a couple of terms. Orientalism. For those who don't know what Orientalism is, you probably have heard the term, uh, the term before. Uh, the interesting thing about Orientalism is that it's a term uh, that refers to how the West has traditionally looked at the East, the Arab world, the quote-unquote Middle East, and Muslims in general. Now, the interesting thing about the term Orientalism is that it's, it's quite broad. And in fact, it doesn't reflect the true reality and the history uh, that, that actually went on, like the actual history, historical events. But rather, uh, multiple pieces of a picture that paint something that exists outside of history, effectively. Now, the reason why I mention this is that it becomes very easy for someone who is uh, seen as a, as, a, as a Muslim or an Arab or a Palestinian to be racialized, to be dehumanized, and to actually become uh, uh, basically you know, um, seen in an extremely negative light, um, as we all unfortunately have seen in the context of the United States. As Zarifa mentioned, I was born and raised in Palestine. I was um, born in Al Khalil. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, from my perspective, having seen firsthand how the occupation treats me, treats my people, um, treats uh, my family members, and treats our neighbors and everyone in our, in our community, obviously. Um, for me, it was a, a moment where I felt that it was necessary for the world to understand that a lot of what is happening is... Uh, um, is is effectively a, a, a reflection of power structures that exist globally. Let me move on with that. Um, I feel that, I felt that, uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it. Having lived in the occupied Palestinian territory of the West Bank, hello. <laughs> no problem, okay. It's a change of the pace of the day, I suppose. Um, but having grown up and seen the atrocities firsthand have really um, instilled in me the very ideals of what social justice is all about, what equality ought to look like. I never, as a Palestinian, hated Jews for being Jews. I never did. I still don't. Um, I have a problem with an ideology that is exclusionary. And from my perspective, I have taken a path, an educational path. I'm, I'm a professor, as you all know. Um, and I decided to effectively study things that affect my life. When I finished my, uh, uh, my dissertation was about the 1920s and 1930s Palestine, because from my perspective, it was one of those questions that a lot of people were, were asking, but they never found an answer to. Why is it that Palestinians were unable to establish a state in 1948? It's a very interesting question, right? And from my perspective, the answer is quite simple. 
but it was very hard for Westerners, as someone who has actually immigrated to the United States and, and, and studied, um, worked towards my PhD, it was interesting that people weren't understanding it. So for the longest time, I've been perplexed as to why Americans didn't understand the problems of Palestinians. They didn't understand what was happening. Uh, what, what is the question of Palestine? Or not only that, there's no sympathy towards Palestinians. The Palestinians are not even thought of in, in the ways that we ought to think about all humans. There's that particular exception to Palestine that I've always find, found to be problematic. When I first studied um, moving forward in my, in my quote unquote career, if you want to call it that, uh, it's more like actually kind of a path that is riddled with a lot of landmines, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, going uh, into higher education is a very difficult task, and I'm not necessarily patting myself on the shoulder. Sometimes I think that I may sh should have not <laughs> pursued that particular path, uh, especially if you're working on Palestine especially if you're working on questions that are seen as quote unquote controversial and everybody wants to, to remain quote unquote neutral. From my perspective, the idea of neutrality doesn't really reflect actual human positionality, if that makes sense. So let me explain that. Um, I can look and use historical, historical fact to tell a story and also understand that there is a side, a moral side to that story. But oftentimes you find in the West the term neutral is thrown right and left to effectively say neutrality is basically objective analysis. I don't take sides, okay? The idea here, oftentimes the idea of neutrality takes place of, of indecision. People don't have not made a decision. They have not formulated an opinion, uh, an, an informed opinion about an issue. And that it, it presented me, presented me with an opportunity to move forward uh, with, my, with my studies, with my um, uh, academic path and academic adventure. In uh, then uh, 2001, September 11th happened. Okay. So that was an interesting moment that has really transformed how uh, Muslims have, Muslims, Arabs, and Palestinians. And I typically use the three terms, not necessarily interchangeably, they're not. Obviously, we know what an Arab is someone who speaks Arabic as their first language or traces their history to um, an Arabic-speaking household, effectively, background. And um, the term Muslim is someone, it's a religion, obviously. And, and the two are, are separate. Of course, I also want to recognize that the Christian uh, Arab community in, in the uh, Arabic-speaking world has long been part of the region for the longest time. I want to recognize that as well. But the interesting thing is that anything negative about any of those communities is used and weaponized for another identity. As such, Palestinians have really become at the bottom of the totem pole, effectively, from a variety of different angles. Palestinians are racialized, dehumanized, their lives don't matter, okay? And um, when, when, when there are absolutely clear signs of genocide, okay, we don't use the term genocide to speak about Palestine. But the interesting thing I also want to mention, that this term is political, right? When do we choose to use the term Palestine matters? And who chooses to use the term genocide matters? If you all remember, if you're old, I mean, old enough to remember, um, Madeleine Albright, who said, okay, who said how many acts of, you know, acts of genocide did happen uh, in Rwanda, but um, I'm not sure if, genocide happened. So from my perspective is how many acts of genocide need to happen for us to actually call it genocide, for God's sake. And this is where it's at. It's the humanity of Palestinians that has been questioned for the longest time. That is now what we are noticing happening now, currently, in the context of the United States, that this is transforming. Okay? And it's if effectively a revolution that is not necessarily only about Palestine. But it's a, it's a revolution against the status quo that has long, has long been, um, been uh, uh, favoring some people and demonizing and, de and, 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 and racializing other people. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I've always been perplexed as to why Americans never understood the question of Palestine. Well, there are multiple answers to that, but for the first of which is that um, the United States is a colonial 
a, a colonial, a settler colonial state, obviously. We all understand that. We all understand that these lands we're, we're standing on um, are lands that don't belong to white people. We know that. Okay? So effectively, that becomes easier for Americans, more or less, to, to see, well, you know, oh, well, are you suggesting that if you are to quote unquote free Palestine, is that then um, white people have to leave the United States? Well, not particularly, but there's an acknowledgement that we need to, to think about. The fact that there's no acknowledgement of the suffering of the Palestinians is something we have to, uh, to, to pay attention to. Why is it that Palestinians never get that acknowledgement? So <clears throat> there are a couple of things I want to mention, not particularly with regards to um, the, the, the uh, to, to, not particularly with regards to my book per se, but I, I want to highlight that this particular moment that we're witnessing, state violence, state-sponsored violence, the police against our students, against, um, against uh, campuses, against the liberated zones around the country that have been popping up, um, is really a manifestation of this power structure I mentioned. But another thing to this is to say, these liberated zones, which uh, you can call it whatever you want, and camp it or no one, but I think liberated zones seems to be the term that a lot of folks would like to use for obvious reasons, okay? Um, so these liberated zones are not coming out of nowhere. There's a reason as to why they exist, as to why they're uh, popping up around the country. And they're happening because as uh, uh, Mr. Pellet earlier mentioned that, you know, um, that Palestinian, the Palestinian cause is not even talked about. The halls of power are not considering who is uh, the uh, victim here, that Palestinians are seen as the perpetrators, ignoring 76 years of a displacement and Nakba. And not only that, neglecting that there is a, a, a destruction of a society, an entire society that took place 1947, 1948, that Palestinians became, quote unquote, homeless. They're not homeless. They're not just refugees. They did not choose to be refugees. Their lands were taken from them, okay? But that very destruction of, of, of society ultimately created opportunities that I will be talking about in a little bit. Palestinians, effectively, their very calamity, if I may, their very calamity and, and obstacle to existence and their, their atrocity of the Nakba, the catastrophe that had been bestowed upon them that continues to take place. The Nakba is not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing, as we all know. Any person, whether you're Palestinian uh, or non-Palestinian, but you understand the, the idea of social justice, every person who understands the idea of social justice and equity and equality understands that what Palestinians are going through is absolutely unjust, period. This is why I believe that people um, who are born into certain ideological uh, positions, if I may, um, and then they find themselves, they go on a journey, they find themselves escaping the bounds of these ideological bounds, um, these ideological uh, uh, positions. Um, I find that to be quite powerful, and, and this is why someone like Miko Pellet is someone that I, that I admire, and I think uh, there are, you know, he's amongst uh, you know, a handful yet growing number of people who, uh, who, who see the light effectively and who understand social justice at a much deeper level, so uh, I want to acknowledge that as well. Um, as we all noticed for the past 25 or so years, and this has actually coincided with my own personal journey coming to this country, which sometimes I feel is great, but it's also the worst thing that I've ever done in my life, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I was like, damn, the price was pretty darn hard. It is, it's very hard for someone to have uh, moved from, from their homeland. And I'll tell you why I actually decided to leave Palestine. So I finished high school, and I went to a university uh, known as Birzeit University, for those who know. It's outside of Ramallah. So there was a checkpoint that uh, stopped, ev stopped me every day. The car in which service, as they call it, shared taxi, form of taxi, moving from Ramallah, going from Ramallah to, to Bir Zayt, the, the town where the university is located. And um, 
The same soldier almost every day would say, oh, Karamdana, please get out. You, you. They knew, just, that, you know, they, somehow they just didn't like how I looked, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, that seems to also happen at airports, but that's a different story. <laughs> so that's, well, it's the same story, but for another day. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. So the, the issue here is that I, I was like, wait a second, if I want to become educated, and I recognize that there's something so significant about being educated, um, and, 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 and be able to fight. I recognize that education is a path that actually suits my approach, if that makes sense. And I realized that I needed to make a decision that is quite difficult for me personally and for my family. I decided to move to the United States to come and actually start quote unquote anew. That was the early, uh, early 1998. Um, and the interesting thing about that time period is that it was the time that uh, uh, Miko mentioned earlier, uh, it was the, the Oslo years. It was supposed to be uh, the greatest years after Oslo, but a great deal of violence um, had taken place. But in addition to this, um, settlements quadrupled pretty much. I mean, it was, it was supposed to be f within five years between 1994 to 1999, 2000, give or take, there should have been a, a, a Palestinian state established, but that never happened. One of the issues was settlements and they accelerated. And so more or less we all saw that the so-called peace process was collapsing. And I realized that if I wanted to get educated, if I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do in my life, I needed to make that decision, that difficult decision. And I did. Moved to the Pacific Northwest. I, I also want to say that there are people who are in this room who met me a day or two after my arrival to this city. So I want to acknowledge them. So thank you very much for opening your, um, opening your cafe for me <laughs> um, and, and, and spending many, many hours of reading and many, many hours of writing and many, many hours of conversations. Um, um, uh, you know, so I, I want to thank you very much. Majid Lu'ata specifically that I'm talking about who owned a cafe on Capitol Hill, which unfortunately no longer exists, but it was my home. It really provided me with a place where I could understand who I am in relation to everything else around me in the Pacific Northwest. And that journey was one also, the journey that, that brought me to this country, was one that allowed me to understand the suffering of a lot of people, not only Palestinians, but to think about my own experience through other people's experiences. And how colonization, particularly settler colonialism, obviously. I mean, settler colonialism means you take a place and you kick them out and you take it. And you say, oh, that's ours. Oh, that's, that's our hummus. That's our falafel, you know, et cetera, <laughs> basically. All right. So this is our home. Right. So you have to understand that effectively that there's an erasure of identity. You erase an identity and it is replaced by another. Right. So it allowed me to understand the suffering of indigenous peoples. It allowed me to understand the suffering of African Americans in this country. It allowed me to understand the suffering of other BIPOC people, black, indigenous, and people of color. It allowed me to understand the economic classism that this society is based on. I recognized immediately, almost immediately, that, uh, I mean, I grew up in a somewhat a leftist household, so I knew Marx. Um, <laughs> Um, and, I, and I knew what, what capitalism was all about, obviously. Um, but to really see it in action is a whole different situation, if I may. Um, and um, having experienced that, having seen the suffering of other people and understand it uh, through, uh, through living in this society, allowed me to see my own cause, the question of Palestine, understanding the suffering of the Palestinian in a much better new light, if that makes sense. Um, and then another thing I want to mention is that um, I, I went to a college, a community college, just like a lot of immigrants who didn't have a lot of money. You go to a community college, you make your way through it. Um, and uh, during that time, the events of the WTO protest took place. Okay? And for me, that day was the late November, uh, November 29, November 30, uh, 1999. Um, it really brought something new for me. It allowed me to see um, something I read about, but not particularly witnessed in the context of the US. 
In the United States, the government is more than willing to use violence whenever, whenever it sees it, uh, it sees a, uh, uh, it, it perceives a threat to the status quo. That day, that day, November 29, November 30th, 1999, made me recognize that there is no difference, there is no difference between authoritarian regimes and quote unquote democratic regimes. And I saw how state violence is unleashed. And for me, that was, I mean, I wasn't necessarily naive per se, but I was definitely naive to think that the idea of democracy could actually be somewhat respected by the quote unquote constitution. That didn't happen. Yet it allowed me to grow. It allowed me intellectually to think at deeper levels and to move to the next stage. Unfortunately, soon after, as I mentioned, 9-11 happened. <laughs> so, um, and I, I, I laugh in the sense now, uh, not necessarily to, uh, to, uh, uh, to suggest that the atrocities were, were terrible that happened, obviously not. But more importantly is that it really presented new forms of control that were not necessarily available prior to that. The militarization of the police soon after emerged after 9-11. Uh, after and, um, and, and not only that, 9-11 was, was a, a factor to accelerate it. But in fact, it was the WTO events. A lot of people trace back the militarization of the police to the WTO events. Okay? Um, and, uh, and it was so interesting to see how, um, how the, the, the state, the, the state, the government, uh, uses its influence to, um, to really, uh, you know, in, in a variety of ways to control what is being said and what is being talked about and introducing forms of surveillance that are not just simply beyond policing. That, as you can imagine, paralleled another experience I had in my previous life in Palestine. Palestine is about not being able to do the normal things that we think about. Miko mentioned a couple of those things. But to go from a town like Khalil to try to go to Nablus all the way up. And by the way, there's, a, there's a, an ancient rivalry between people from Nablus and Khalil, so that's why I'm using that example. At any rate, people from, to go from Khalil all the way to Nablus, you would have to go through multiple checkpoints. You will have to have, and that's in the West Bank I'm talking about. You will have to go through multiple checkpoints. You will have to be humiliated uh, multiple times. And you will always remind it you will always remind it, you're always reminded that you are inferior, that this place doesn't belong to you. Or at least that's what the, what the impression is all about. But what seems to happen, again, actually research shows this. I, I did some of the research and I realized, and, and again, the conclusion of, of some of the studies I've done, were to suggest that the more people suffer, the stronger their resilience uh, uh, becomes in the context of Palestine, period. So that physical disconnection from your aunt that lives in East Jerusalem, for example, from your uncle that lives in Haifa, or relative that, that, that is, lives two towns over. But in order for you to get there, you have to go through multiple checkpoints or drive, you know, drive on roads that are extremely dangerous. I'm from the town of Khalil. I don't know if some of you have been there. But to go from Khalil to Beit Lahim, where Jesus was born, quote unquote, where Jesus was born. To go from Khalil to Beit Lahim, you would have, it's about, give or take, about uh, 14 miles. Nothing, that's it, basically. But you have to go through multiple, multiple um, uh, uh, settlements. And there are checkpoints, obviously. And they can, it can be as little as 15, 20 minutes. But it can also last for a couple of hours, if you're lucky. Um, and not only that, the Israeli settlers who live in those settlements are violent. And I've seen that so many times in my life, and it's really frightening to see how a state enables gangs, enables um, militias, basically, um, and, and provides them with guns, and not only it protects them as well. Um, so that violence is, is, is horrendous, to say the least. Um, but that experience to be able to be to not be able to do what we consider to be normal things in the context of the United States 
you can easily go from Seattle to Portland and whatnot uh, without supposedly, without being controlled. Well, unless you happen to be from a particular community, we all know. Uh, we understand how African Americans have been treated in this country quite well, um, particularly. And it doesn't mean that it's only uh, the African American community, but we know pl police brutality and the black community in this country. We know what it, that's all about. And it's an extension, obviously, of how people are racialized and dehumanized. Um, and it goes back, honestly, to slavery. So not much going on in terms of how people are seen in this country, sadly. We pride ourselves with some ideals, with democracy and human rights, um, diversity, inclusion, <laughs> equity. Um, we, we love those terms, we do. And because they speak to certain things that, that really touch deep with regards to how we view social justice. The problem is much bigger than simply um, uh, talking about democracy uh, or, or, or holding certain ideals like human rights uh, quite high. It's much bigger than that. It's a, as I mentioned earlier, it's a reflection of power. <clears throat> and not only that, definitions and meanings are political. This is why, for example, when you say what's happening in Gaza is genocide, it's not seen by everyone as such. Um, because that term genocide is a political term. It really reflects certain uh, positions, uh, certain uh, ideals, and it's a quote-unquote complicated term. Whereas if you change Gaza to anything, anywhere else, any other people in the world, it will be seen differently. And that brings me to the United States itself and how Orientalism has been really, um, I think, Miko, you mentioned that Americans have had Zionist education, K through 12 education. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, there's something about how Americans have uh, seen Palestine, the question that I, that I posed earlier, and as to why that happens. And my upcoming book really answers the question as to why is it that Americans have never thought of Palestinians as human? And one, that's the first thing. The second is, things are changing. Why are they changing? Okay. Uh, and then three, where are we headed? Where are we headed with the question of Palestine? What's going to happen after that? And, you know, what are the, the possibilities moving forward? I'm going to mention a couple of factors, but not necessarily go down the, you know, the details of the book. For that, you will have to buy the book. I'm kidding, but I'm happy to share it <laughs> anytime you want. Just email me. Um, at any rate, um, the, one of the most fundamental things, as I mentioned, is how Orientalism poses uh, uh, the question of Arabs, Muslims, and Palestinians in general. But then in addition to this, if you think about the term Middle East, Middle East and Middle East, that term is not really the indigenous term of the people who live in that region. The Middle East is a Eurocentric centric term. The Middle East is, is defined by the Europeans. It's the only region in the world, it is the only region in the world that is defined by people not indigenous to the region. And that is quite powerful. Because today, you find Arabs, Arabic-speaking people, in Arab countries using the term al-Sharq al-Awsat, the term that, which is the translation of the Middle East. Why is that? It's a reflection, really, of power structures. And that brings me to the idea of centering Palestinian narrative. Whoever has power is able to tell a story, a story that suits their views, a story that suits their needs. You've always heard that term, victors write history, right, to that effect, right? Um, but the interesting thing is that that has, be, has been challenged for the past 25, 30 years, give or take. And I describe that in, 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 in some details, but primarily, uh, primarily it has to do, as I mentioned, with how, uh, uh, you know, I, I, it's funny, um, I have a quote, but I'll, I'll get it in a little bit. Um, <laughs> It has to do with, with some of the transformations that have took place, but primarily with how American society itself has changed on a number of things. The first has to do with um, the introduction of the internet, first of all. The internet allowed new platforms 
for conversation around the question of Palestine and any other questions for that matter. So it provided a much more, uh, uh, much more equitable space, if that makes sense. It took a while for that to happen. But there's something quite fundamental, as I mentioned, the calamity of Palestinians and, and, and their uh, living in transnational spaces because of necessity, people living in, in diaspora, people forced to live uh, uh, elsewhere, not in their own homelands. Uh, that became an opportunity for Palestinians. So the very existence of Palestinians in transnational spaces in the United States, in Europe, in Latin America, throughout the world, has really changed how Palestine is talked about. Advocacy for Palestine takes new shapes. And not only that, the interesting thing about Palestinians is that they have what is known in social science linked fate. A Palestinian in Palestine feels that their fate is connected to a Palestinian living in diaspora. So for that, that's typically a term used to study, say, Latinx communities, uh, African-American community. If something happens to another person who holds the same identity as yours, uh, would that affect your life? And Palestinians score quite high on that. Yes, absolutely. You ask any Palestinian around the world, where are you from? And they will tell you exactly where they're from. Yet they've never been allowed to go. They've never been allowed to enter to Palestine, to visit, to visit their, their, where they're originally from. That's assuming that their town still is intact. More than 430 villages, as we all know, uh, have been were destroyed in, in, during the Nakba. Um, and uh, the, the, the inhabitants of, of those villages became refugees, either in the West Bank or, or the Gaza Strip uh, and other surrounding countries or globally. But that very global, quote unquote, I, for the lack of a better term, homelessness effectively, that oftentimes it's seen as like poor Palestinians and whatnot. But that very, very um, condition itself became the very strength of Palestinians. Having spent um, decades in these communities, Palestinians are able to speak to different, uh, to different people. Um, but let me uh, add a little bit more on that. Um, Palestinians grow uh, grow up in different communities now, and they're able to communicate their social justice issues to these different communities in ways that previous communities couldn't. And I'm not necessarily saying that people who have lived here 50 years ago were not advocating for Palestine, absolutely not. What I'm trying to say is that there are new platforms now that allow people to uh, present new ideas around Palestine than, than previously. And then there's also something more important uh, in my perspective with regards to how American society has transformed. Um, if we think about uh, young, the young generation, um, uh, the Pew, Pew Research um, uh, Institute Center, Pew, Pew Research Center, has a study um, that basically says that everyone, those who are born between the years of 1980 to 2000, are the most diverse group in the United States, particularly. And then in addition to that, that they're the most uh, uh, progressive politically. Um, but then the third piece of that is that they don't, they're not churchgoers, those who identify as, as Christian, uh, and they're less religious. And that brings us to another point, which is how Christianity in the United States has long been framed in relation to the question of Palestine and Israel. Christian Zionism is a very, very powerful force with how Americans see uh, and talk about and discuss the question of Palestine and Israel. For those who don't know, but there's a prophecy, and primarily, you know, as I said, when I say the United States, I mean uh, American forms of Christianity. They vary, obviously. Uh, but to varying degrees, to varying degrees, um, Christians in the United States have, uh, uh, primarily the Protestant, uh, have a particular prophecy whereby <clears throat> all Jews will have to return to the land of Israel. And what's going to happen? There's going to be a big war, of course. You know, there's going to be a big war. Um, Muslims will be killed, more or less. And that, that, that idea, it's kind of an uh, Armageddon type of a, of a discourse. 
So there's that, in fact, I mean, there's a lot of uh, accounts to suggest that Christian Zionism introduced the idea of Zionism, that Christians, in fact, introduced the idea of Zionism well before the Zionists themselves were really thinking about this in the early 19th century. 19th century. So that, however, is changing, as I mentioned. More people are uh, becoming more attuned to different meanings of what equity means. What's that all about? Okay. But then also, people are really pissed off with the US government. And by the way, I just want to mention, I'm talking about the United States, but that's, there's a global trend here. And when I talk about global trend, I'm not talking about the global south. Trust me, the global south knows what the hell is going on in Palestine. I'm talking about, quote unquote, the Western world. And we all know, whatever the United States does, literally everyone else will follow. Okay? I mean, in case you didn't know, in Germany, if you wear, if you wear a kufiya, you'll get arrested. Yep. If, you, if you raise a Palestinian flag, you'll get arrested. So I'm just saying, of, in Germany of all places, by the way, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Is there a change? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so this, this, this transformation that is taking place is happening with the younger generation. And although it is generational, I also want to highlight that it's not only generational. It's about people understanding social justice in new ways um, that has been expanded upon and framed by younger people. Okay. Um, as I said, this is the most equity-focused generation. So uh, unfortunately, I'm a little older than that. So, <laughs> But I'm still, I would suspect, I hope that I'm seen as a uh, uh, social justice-focused person. Um, but I do want to mention that what happened in the United States with how younger folks have become angry with the status quo, angry with what's going on. The Occupy movement. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have to pause here. Okay. <laughs> the Occupy movement. People are pissed off. People are angry. And why would they not be angry as far as I'm concerned? I'm an immigrant. I came to this country. And there was this thing called the American dream. <laughs> I realized that the American dream was, in fact, a nightmare. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But more importantly, from my perspective, is that I realized that whoever has the power, the power of the day, can tell a certain narrative. Okay? Whoever has power can tell the story. And not only that, if you challenge that story, you become a target. You become a target. And the interesting thing is that racialization is a tool that takes place uh, that, that's really used immediately. 9-11 uh, is the perfect example of that. Um, then, I mean, ask any Muslim how they felt after 9-11 trying to, to go to the airport. I actually you know, I have Arab Christian friends who were like being, being pulled aside, like, you know, do you pray every day? I'm like, uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know what you're talking about. So my point is that there's, there, it, it really reflects the lack of knowledge uh, of the Am American establishment, if that makes sense. Um, but then more importantly, I think it, it shows that, um, that there is a deficit of knowledge, uh, but also how the usage of the most basic undemocratic tools um, is readily possible, and it happens everywhere. The WTO events showed me that as well. So <clears throat> a couple of things I also want to mention, that um, when we're talking about the liberated zones on campuses and we see the violence, and we see the accusations that these people are racist and terrorists and anti-Semitism and little Gazas, quote unquote. Um, that is also fits within the larger power structures of how we see the world, unfortunately. Okay, um, and again, um, I can keep talking about uh, the reasons as to why Americans have long thought of Palestinians and Palestine as inferior, as one that they don't fully uh, sympathize with. Um, but at, at, the, at the heart of it, um, it also reflects uh, how the United States is willing to, uh, willing to uh, basically treat its own citizens, its own students, and the power structure of universities can turn around and call the police on their own students. Um, and to me, that's, that, that's something very painful to witness and to see. 
Um, what happened at Columbia, it's interesting, today and yesterday was a conference for Professor Rashid Khalidi, one of the foremost historians of Palestine. It was a conference for his retirement, and it was supposed to take place in Columbia, where he is a professor, but it had to be done off campus. Um, but it's such an interesting for me, and when I, when I saw that this morning, and I was like, wow, it's such an iconic moment when something like this happens, uh, that his, his retirement conference does not take place at his home institution anymore because of police brutality, poli because of, uh, of what happened uh, on that campus. So what I witnessed in the United States paralleled my experience in Palestine. Incarceration in the United States is something we have to, uh, to, to, to understand, that it's a tool of oppression. Um, it obviously parallels how Israel treats Palestinians. Palestinians, you know, can be in prison indefinitely without a charge. We all know this, okay? And it was, in fact, there's a, something called uh, um, administrative detention, okay? Hukum idari. Hukum means rule uh, or, or, or uh, ruling, you know? Idari means administrative, right? Al hukm al idari is actually from the days of the British colonial authorities. And it was instituted in 1936, something that Zarifa mentioned earlier, which is the Arab Revolt. There was a prison called uh, Sarafan Prison um, around Haifa, okay, whereby Palestinians were just <laughs> rounded up and put in that prison um, without a charge because of their uh, uh, alleged activities against the colonial uh, powers, against the British. Now, the interesting thing about 1936 through 1939, when it, the, the, the revolt ended, the interesting thing is that it was the first time that Palestinians took upon themselves, took it upon themselves, that they're going to, to resist the British authorities, not only the Zionists who are arriving and building institutions that, that really infringing upon the economy and so on, but they targeted the colonial authorities that have allowed for something like this to happen and to thrive. And <clears throat> obviously the response of the British was that of uh, brutality, uh, absolute brutality. I mean, my grandfather was telling me about his time in prison, uh, Sarafan prison, and he said, all I have to say is that it was absolutely, absolutely terrible. And uh, I also wanna, uh, I, I remember a late professor, may he rest in peace, um, Farhad Ziyadi, uh, who remember for those who remember him in the room, he was telling me in details about what he heard about uh, Sarafan prison. So the idea of incarceration is so embedded as a form of punishment, whether in Palestine, perpetrated by Israel against Palestinians, um, but also even perpetrated by, by Israel against Jewish Israelis, if they don't fall in line, if that makes sense. Incarceration is, to this day, it is used against students who are protesting exercises of their First Amendment rights. And that's, is that okay? If we don't agree with it, is that okay? Even, my point is the interesting thing about academic freedom and, and, and freedom of speech is that it ought to be thought of as uh, multi-ways, not only one way or another, but rather to think about it as a, as a cultural understanding of who we are. You know, we accept even opinions that we disagree with. But unfortunately, uh, in the context of the United States, um, you can say pretty much whatever you want. But when you, when you talk about Palestine, that's a whole different question. The term PEP, progressive except for Palestine. Anyone heard that before? Okay, yep. Progressive except for Palestine is a thing. Okay? In, in meaning that you find a great deal of Americans in the context of the United States whereby they, they are progressive but when it gets to the question of Palestine, they just stop, okay? That, however, is changing. So from my perspective, I don't necessarily believe in the idea of inevitability of victory, or hatmiyat al-intisar, as they call it in Arabic, that we will always win, will always, not particularly, but from my perspective, what I see is something extremely powerful happening today in this country. What I notice, what I notice, what, I, what I'm observing, is an absolute shift in that tide. And it was long, it's been long coming. And it's not only because Palestinians 
have now started talking about Palestine. It's not only simply because Palestinians live everywhere, which is a factor, okay? They live everywhere and they're able to communicate their struggle in, new, in ways that other people, host communities, host societies understand. Um, but in addition to this, that there's a lot of great changes that are happening in these host societies. And again, if we talk about the United States, these changes are happening and have been happening, okay? Transformations happening within American society are ushering effectively a new way for us to think and talk about the question of Palestine. All Palestinians are asking for, as Miko Peled mentioned multiple times, they're asking for equality. I'm not sure why is that threatening. <laughs> I mean, we know why is that threatening, but we know that. But, but for someone to ask for equality and to be perceived as a threat is a problem to me. And not only that, the, the opposing narrative is one that is based around exclusion. That I also have a problem with. As I, as I, you know, anecdotally looking around the people I know, the younger, I mean, Zarifa was my student, I have a lot of students and I, and I see this, I, I, I understand and I notice something um, qualitatively different about how the, and I don't mean this to say the younger generation, but it is the younger generation that are able to understand equity in ways that were not possible before. And I also want to mention different types of rights that people understand in this society. LGBTQ, for example, right? Other minority groups, as I mentioned. Black Lives Matter, you know? Um, the Occupy Movement, as I also mentioned that earlier. These things reflect that there is a great deal of problems in this society that now are being uh, kind of coming, coming to fruition. Now, <clears throat> A couple of things I want to mention before I, I end my talk is to say that um, sooner or later, sooner or later, justice will prevail. There's no question about it. If history has taught us anything, it taught us that oppression doesn't work. Not only that. It backfires. So what's happening now around the country is going to, um, to change how, um, how uh, the way I see it is that what's happening around the country now is, uh, is, is the manifestation of something that has been long coming um, and it's the beginning of a new era. And I hope one day uh, we will be uh, celebrating the equality of, uh, that Palestinians have so desperately need and for, uh, for Palestinian suffering to be seen through similar lights as we do other people's suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Donna. I think that us at the UW, like we have these gems here that I don't, maybe we take for granted sometimes, that we have these minds among us and teaching us. So thank you so much for all that you do. And thank you to the organizers for the last minute shuffle. We are early in the campaign and I appreciate the opportunity to take a moment and speak to you all. So my name is Melissa Chowdhury. I was born Melissa Rasmussen in the United States and I was raised to believe in liberty and justice for all. I stood up every morning as a little elementary school student and dutifully pledged my allegiance to the flag. And I remember when Abu Ghraib broke. I believe my father was already deployed to Iraq. He was a Navy doctor. And I saw the images that showed the dehumanization of people that was not in keeping with the ideals of the country that I was raised by. And I think if you're an American child that, and you have that moment, one of two things happen. Either your heart breaks or you die a little bit inside. I think a lot of people in this country have died inside. But my heart broke. It got better a little bit when dad told me how on a trip to Israel, military trip, he took a walk down to the Palestinian side late at night. He wasn't supposed to go. And a Palestinian gentleman brought him in, this strange American guy, and gave him tea. 
and his family told their stories of their dispossession and everything that Israel had put them through for generations. And he left that night a changed man. That told me that hearts can be changed. Direct stories, personal connection, we can show people that there's another way, that common humanity is actually accessible to all. And that gives me hope because of this moment we're in right now, politically. Right now, we have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, deeply fundamental constitutional rights being trampled on, being ignored, being overridden by acts of Congress. But there are two sides to America, there always have been. There's been the racism and the genocide and the white supremacy, that's been there since the beginning. But there has also been a vision for shared common humanity. That goes all the way back to the beginning, even the first European settlers to come here. They weren't all genocidal. Some of them were like, wow, these native people, these are cool. We can be brothers on the land, we can trade, like this is great. From there, there's a common thread through the Civil War, through the Civil Rights Movement, through Vietnam, through the WTO. What is happening right now, speaking up for the human rights of Palestine, these liberated zones, this is in keeping with the very best traditions of what it means to be American. And I'm running for Congress to take that message and that principle and that hope to the halls of power. I'm running in District 9, that's South King County. That's Bellevue, Mercer Island, South Seattle, all the way down Kent, Tukwila, Renton, Auburn, Federal Way. The incumbent there right now is Adam Smith. So I take it you've heard of him. We, uh, it's not secret. If you go to opensecrets.org, you know, so I'm not stepping over any slander lines when I say, his biggest funders are the Israel industry, APAC and the rest. The funders after that are Boeing and Raytheon and the other people who profit from the creation of bombs and bullets to kill children. He's the head of the Armed Services Committee. So he's in charge. He's a Democrat, quote unquote. He votes kind of the right way on housing and education and other stuff. I promise I'm gonna do all that too, right? But he takes $2 billion from his district in military taxes and he gives back 24 million. That's 100 to one. And he uses that money to line the pockets of his billionaire donors. And, as you probably heard, he calls peaceful protesters like you, your friends, my friends, every one of these liberated zones, totalitarians and fascists, for exercising our freedom of speech and assembly. And he claims to represent a district that is 60% people of color and 30% immigrants, my family. So this is why I'm running for Congress. I cannot live with myself as an American and as a Muslim if I do not challenge him. Just very briefly, we were driving up today and I saw an American flag waving by the freeway. And that flag has meant a lot of different things to me at different points in my life. When I was a little kid, full of that innocent patriotism that most of us have for our, any country when we're small, I used to, to sing my heart out for it. And then that heartbreak kicked in like I was talking about, right? But today I was filled with a terrifying hope, a beautiful hope that maybe with Palestine awakening the conscience of the country and of the world, maybe if enough courage and humanity and hope and self-awareness and humility and power and strength flows through the veins of the good people of America, and there are a lot of us, maybe we can be the first country to consciously de-imperialize, to step back from our thousand military bases, to step back from our economic hegemony, to step into common humanity and being a responsible member of a richly diverse, beautiful multipolar world with a rich and vibrant multiracial democracy at home. I don't know if that's possible, but I know that if it is, it's going to be thanks to everyone in this room and everyone like us, all of the immigrants who come here believing in the principles of liberty and equality and the American dream that America says we stand for, we could decide to make that real. All of the people of color, all of the Muslims who believe also in liberty and justice for all and common humanity, and everyone whose souls are intact, who, who chose to have their hearts broken rather than deadened. If we come together, we can make this real.
In order to do that, we need to get active. We need to get politically engaged and organized. I have a website, ask me for a flyer, I'll give it to you, but I'm only one person. We need everyone in this room and everyone you know to register to vote, to vote your conscience. If you don't know how to register to vote, Google it, it's fine. If you cannot vote, that's okay. You can contribute, you can organize, you can volunteer. Ballots for the primary, I'll speak selfishly for a second. Ballots were gonna be mailed out at the end of July. They have to be mailed in by August 6th for me to make it through the primaries and face off against Adam in November. If you want that to be possible, help everybody you know in that district, vote for me in August and then again in November. Like our esteemed speakers said, we can free Palestine through political action if we work together. Together, we are unstoppable. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, future Congresswoman Melissa Chowdhury and Shalma. Okay, so now we are going to be able to have the opportunity to hear our individual questions answered by our speakers. A lot of people ask questions, I think, curious and maybe conflicted about how to respond to popular Zionist narratives. So maybe I can pose some of these questions to you both and you can tell this student how you would personally respond to this Zionist argument. Okay, question number one. We always hear that before October 7th, there was a ceasefire, and that the loss of life is because of Hamas. How do we respond to that? You know, it's very difficult to respond to uh, ignorance, and it's very difficult to respond to people who are saying what they're saying to, to make a point, not because they want a conversation. So um, it, that question comes up a lot, because that claim is out there. They put that claim out there. Even Hillary Clinton said, you know, there was a ceasefire before October 7, and everything was great, everything was fine. Are you out of your mind? What kind of a stupid, ignorant question is that? There are over two million people in Gaza living in starvation, living in a concentration camp. What the hell are you talking about? There's a ceasefire before. You know what I mean? It makes absolutely no sense. It completely distorts. So you either see it as an opportunity to give them a lecture or just ignore it because it's impossible to respond to that level of, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a cruelty. It's a, it's, a, it's a desire to, it's not a question that wants an answer. It's a question that wants to put you on the defensive. And when you're, when you're, uh, when, you, when you're faced with that, the worst thing you can do is go on the defensive. So that, that, that's, that's what I have to say about that. Um, I'm not going to add much more except to say that it's very obvious for anyone who reads any newspaper <laughs> from my perspective to understand that things un did not start on October 7th. Whichever way you look at it, not necessarily to say that we, uh, you know, that anyone is making that stuff up. You look at any, any publication, literally around the world, even including ones that are not actually, <laughs> that are not particularly um, supportive of the Palestinian quote unquote cause. But you will always find that, that, you know, these things are weird and strange. And I'm sorry to say this, but like these types of questions sometimes, um, they're not really meant for us to learn. They're meant for us to defend something that, you know, that I'm not really sure, sometimes I'm not even sure what that is. Oftentimes we hear the term like, do you condemn Hamas or not? This is not the question, so I'm not answering that. But, yeah, well. But the, 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 the question about this is that there's also, I, I want you to recognize that um, there is something legal to it. There's a legal implication, this question, whichever way you answer it, there's a legal implication associated with the answer. Um, especially that uh, Hamas is seen as a, um, as a terrorist organization in the United States when you say, I do or I don't, there's some ramifications associated with it. And that's the first part. But then two, I'm sorry, it really doesn't, if you really care about the well-being of people, whether they happen to be Jewish, Muslim, Christian, agnostic for that matter, um, that question is really not productive, to just put that, throw that out there. Again, that question is hypothetical. So I posed that question and I destroyed it. So forgive me for doing that. 
um, with, with regards to Hamas. Uh, but, but these types of questions, um, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. It's just that I, I'd rather have something much more deeper for us to, to provide a much more meaningful engagement. Great. Um, and I think also Miko spoke about kind of <coughs> the irony and hypocrisy around allowing the world to hyper-focus on the symptom of the larger issue. So I hope that, that also kind of cleared up that question as well because there were a couple people that asked it. Here's an interesting one. Is a two-state solution still viable today? If not, what is the ideal alternative in your opinion? Okay, um, simple answer is no. Is a two-state solution viable? <laughs> it's no. Um, I mean, the thing is that there's under no circumstances, you know, that the two-state solution is, any vi is viable in any way, shape, or form. If you visit, if you look at the map, if you understand the, uh, the, what is actually happening on the ground in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and how the two are disconnected, how the occupation uh, authorities address movement, how, how surveillance takes place, how incarceration, as I mentioned earlier, is a tool to, to, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of control people. You will know that that's not even a possibility. There's no autonomy of any sort currently. Under, and like, it's just simply that's not viable, unless, hypothetically speaking, that all of the settlements are pushed out of the West Bank. I don't see that happening. But then as far as I'm concerned, that still doesn't solve the issue, right? There's a much deeper issue uh, that we, we, we have to, to, to think of. Now, so solution, what is the solution? And it's been said, it's nothing new. Um, I mean, Edward Said, literally, like as early as the 1970s, he said this, okay? Um, and for a lot of people, that seems to be a long time ago, but it's not. However, um, Edward Said mentioned in the sense that, look, equality is something important. Uh, we value, for example, as American society, we value equality. Why is it a problem for us to advocate for equal rights from, uh, quote unquote, river to the sea, right? Um, and, and everyone that lives in between has equal rights, which is something uh, Miko mentioned earlier, okay? Um, mentioned in the sense that this is obviously the way to, uh, uh, we all understand that what, comes, what comes with it with regards to the current circumstances. If we have a, uh, you know, a one state, quote unquote, one state democratic uh, society, regardless of who, where you come from, pluralistic form of society. Um, we all understand that that basically would become the death of the idea of an exclusive state for the Jewish people. Um, and that's obviously where Israel is pushing against it. That's not a thing that people are thinking about. I do believe, however, that things are obviously changing um, in a number of levels, not only in the United States, but things are changing in Israel. And I'm not saying that the change is perfect at all. I'm just saying that there's a lot of discontent. There are growing numbers of Israeli. We know the, new, the idea of the new historian, not to give them too much credit, the idea of a new historian whereby uh, uh, certain pieces of information about 1948 that have been hidden for a long time in the archives now, uh, since the 19, uh, 1980s, but particularly late 1990s on, there's a new uh, kind of movement known as the new historians, the new Israeli historian, that really talk about the realities of what happened in 1948. So um, that number is growing. I mean, I go to Middle East uh, Studies Association conferences, and they're a generation of young Israeli historians who are actually like, who, are, who kind of are part of that uh, thinking. That, so my point is that there's something happening around what is it, what does the history of Israel look like? What is the actual things that happened on the ground that day? Well, not day, the, you know, the history of the Nakba. But then in addition to this, it's like, where are we headed? And, and a lot of those debates are changing the narrative. Um, I mean, you know, it's not only in, in, in uh, globally, uh, but more importantly, globally. That, that is really going to affect Israel in ways that uh, we're not anticipating. I mean, uh, anyway, I'll stop here. I'd answer that question with a question. What are the virtues of the two-state solution? Well, what are the virtues of a two-state solution? And the second question is, who gets the small portion and who gets the big portion? 
How does that determine? How does that determine? Because I think the the assumption there's some the assumption for reasons beyond understanding that the Palestinians deserve the smaller portion of Palestine and somebody else gets the bigger portion. But how, why is that determined that way? I mean, why not to do it the other way? So, yes, I mean, I, well, I, I don't know what the virtues are and I certainly can't figure out how it's going to work and who gets which portion, you know? So, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's again, it's, 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 um, it's a question that's posed either as some kind of a challenge or as a result of ignorance. Because the only people who still talk about two states are people who are either ignorant or are or Zionists and want to maintain the Zionist control over Palestine. Those are the only two types of people who discuss the two-state solution today. And um, so I always reply with it, I reply with, it with these questions. What are the virtues and who gets what part? And usually that's where the conversation ends. Okay, so this question it was addressed again by Miko when he was talking about, I think, the Amnesty Apartheid Report, also the Human Rights Watch Report, the Beit Salem Report. But this question asks, what are clear signs, for people that didn't read the report, what are clear signs and indications that Israel is indeed an apartheid state? You want to? Sure. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I was in South Africa. And, uh, and for, for Apartheid Week, Palestine Apartheid Week or something, I was a guest speaker. And so the other side brought a guest speaker, an Israeli, you know, who's a Zionist. And we were both on a TV show. And the moderator is a black African, and he's asking me that same question. And I explain why it's an apartheid state. And then he's asking the other guy, who was actually a professor at some university, how it's not. And this is live TV. And the guy, he says, so, so can you explain to us how it's not? And the, this guy who was a young, young professor. He's like, <laughs> and it's live TV. And you know, the clock is ticking. And he's just sitting there with his mouth open. And then finally, finally it clicked and he said, well, well you can't really compare. It's, it's not a, you can't compare. It's not a comparison. You can't compare, you know, whatever. I mean, Africans living in South Africa can see that it's an apartheid state. It's that glaring, it's that obvious. When you have different parts of the population all governed by the same government, living under different sets of laws, that's it. What else do you need? Now, on top of that, the, the, the Jews live under all the same laws regardless of where they live throughout the country, right? Palestinians, the laws that govern the lives of Palestinians depend on specifically where they live. So the, there's an area that used to be called the West Bank. People still use that name. It's ridiculous. There's no West Bank. It's Judea and Samaria. That's it. Or if you accept that it's all Palestine, then of course it's, it's Palestine. But there's no such thing as West Bank anymore. There are... It's like I said, it's, a, it's, it's been integrated to, to the apartheid state completely, except that there are, as they define it, this is how the Israeli bureaucracy defines it, pockets of an alien population. That's how they define the ghettos where three and a half million Palestinians live. Pockets of an alien population. This is in their literature. So you've got those Palestinians. Then you've got the Palestinians who live under one set of laws, which is military law. Then you have the Palestinians in Jerusalem who live under a different set of laws. You know, I always like, to, you know, I have friends who's, fa who's from Jerusalem, whose families have been in Jerusalem, recorded history of 800 years, 500 years. And they live here and they can't go back because they lost their status. And their status was, the status of Jerusalemites, Palestinians, is kind of like an alien resident. 800 years of family history and they're alien residents. My family came from, you know, from Russia less than 100 years ago or so. And I have full citizenship. I've been gone for a long time. If I go back tomorrow, there's no problem. I still have a citizenship. So that's the second part. Then you've got Gaza, which is, of course, a concentration camp. Then you've got the Palestinians in the Naqab in the south, about 350,000 Palestinian 
uh, Bedouin who are citizens of Israel who live under a bureaucracy called the Agency for the Development of the Negev, because you know they call the Naqab Negev. So that's a whole other agency that has its own law enforcement and you know horrific you know laws that discriminate against the Palestinian Bedouin. And then you've got the other Palestinian citizens of Israel who live in the other part of 1948. And there's not a single Palestinian anywhere in Palestine that has even remotely live under the same rules, policies, or laws that I would if I lived there or Israeli Jews live. So it's not just an apartheid, it's a, a particularly sadistic type of an apartheid state. And then, and it actually kind of goes back to the previous question, um, not the two-state one, but the one before. Um, you know, there was no ceasefire, there was a ceasefire. Well, there were hundreds of Palestinians being murdered by Israel in the West Bank, hundreds of Palestinians, not to say, because this was not a particular attack at that time, this is before, between attacks in the Gaza Strip, people dying from curable diseases, tens of thousands of home demolition in the Naqab alone, in the southern part of Palestine alone, God knows how many home demolitions in the West Bank, and on and on and on and on and on, thousands and thousands of, pol of political prisoners in jail. So, yes, there was a ceasefire before the October 7th. Of course there was, everything was just fine, you know? So again, the details are important. And you just line up, line, just outline the details. And that whole claim of somehow some Israel being a democracy, or there not being a ceasefire, or everything being fine, it just kind of all collapses. Um, in 1967, um, the preemptive war, quote unquote, that Israel carried out against Arab countries, including Egypt. I mean, the Air Force of Egypt was literally obliterated before it even left the tarmac, right? Like it was on the tarmac, literally the absolute vast majority. I think a couple of uh, jets were able to fly, right? Um, but uh, that preemptive war, quote unquote, ended up with, created, Israel became, became three times its size in six days, okay? Three times its size, the territory wise. The uh, Sahara Sina, or the Sinai Desert, um, uh, the West Bank, of course, which had been under uh, Jordanian authority from 48 to until then. Um, of course, uh, Gaza, uh, Gaza Strip was also under the authority of the Egyptians, but that was also uh, uh, controlled and occupied. And then the Golan Heights as well. In, and I also want to mention, East Jerusalem was also the same. As Miko mentioned, there are different levels of, of authority. I mean, uh, not authority, but like different layers of rights. So. When we talk about the different layers of rights, uh, the, the, they're basically created kind of a hierarchy uh, where if you happen to be a Jewish Israeli, you have the highest, uh, pretty much all the laws that are available, uh, that, that the state belongs to you, more or less. Uh, the second level would be, you know, again, there's, uh, the, we can talk about the Sephardim as well, but not gonna get to that for a sec. Legally speaking, the second level would really apply to Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenship, who did not become refugees in 1948. That's the second layer. The third layer are people from East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. They have a similar status, which is, as Miko mentioned, it is like a, kind of a resident alien. What does that actually mean? Like, you know, you, um, you get a, a laissez-passer, kind of a travel document Israeli that would allow you to fly, for example, if you want to, but you don't really have a state per se. You're not an Israeli citizen. However, you're able to move. There's a movement possibility to go into Israel and whatnot, but it's a status, similar to the Golan Heights. It allows you to move, uh, but again, it's not a citizenship. Then the fourth layer is that of people who live in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, when, I, when I was in Palestine uh, as growing up, my ID color was orange. That actually meant it's a West Bank ID. People from the Gaza Strip, their ID color was green. Not the current green, it's a different green. Yes, the old one? Oh, damn. No, the current one, okay. So the new one is different, a different color. Like, so it's a different color ID, right? Um, and then if you happen to be an Israeli, the Israeli is blue. It's a blue, it's kind of a, the casing of the identification card. And um, the interesting thing is that at a checkpoint, at a checkpoint, uh, they say, can you please raise your ID? A soldier with an M16 says, show me your IDs. And people will all raise them like, okay, all the orange to the side, all blue walk one by one towards me, 
okay? So it's an easy way, I mean, obviously, I'm not gonna even get into that, how ridiculous and racist and, and, and horrendous this is. I'm not gonna get into that, okay? But the idea here is that it's an easy, cheap way to discriminate against people because of who they are and the type of identity they carry. I'm not gonna say that it's reminiscent of things that happened earlier in the 20th century. I'm gonna keep that for you to figure out. But another, yeah, you, you, yeah, um, you did, yes, he did. <laughs> um, but but it, I, I just want to kind of emphasize the fact that internationally recognized to be the same territory, quote unquote, uh, like let's say for example, the, the West Bank is seen internationally as an occupied territory from 1967, right? The problem is that the rights of people that live on that piece of land differ based on who the hell they are. If you happen to be Jewish, as we all know, you actually have civilian law that follows you, right? And not only that, you have protection of the military and the army behind you. Sorry. Um, that's the second. But then, in, 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 with regards to Palestinians who live in the West Bank, the, the military law is what operates in terms of how they're uh, treated in the eyes of the law from, the perspe from that perspective. As such, that's by definition in by itself. I just gave you two somewhat complicated levels as to why that actually is, is apartheid type of a system. It's based on discrimination. It's the, this discrimination is based on different identities and so on. So that's an answer to that question. Great. Okay, this will be interesting to hear your different perspectives, but more so your different experiences. How do you respond to people claiming different definitions of, of, different definitions of Zionism? On the same note, what is the definition you abide by? Okay. <laughs> so, so Zionism, obviously, okay, so when do you wanna begin? 17th century, 18th century? Because I'm happy to do it. So we can, we can, we can do that. Yeah, academics, so I'm sorry, this is a university, so you have to do that. So, look, the reason why Zionism exists is because of Europe. Europe had a Jewish problem, the idea of Jewish problem. As such, when European nation state was developed, it excluded the Jewish people. The Pale of Settlement is the most famous example of this, which is in, in Russia. Tsarist Russia established a large, humongous territory where Jews were allowed to live period. They couldn't live anywhere else. That's where they had to live permanently. It's called the Pale of Settlements. And that happened in, in, in the late 18th century. And it stayed, remained, late 18th century, imagine that, until 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution, until Tsarist Russia was gone. Okay? So you're talking about a hell of a long time where Jewish people were excluded from that idea of, of, of being part of larger Russian society. Now, now that's one form of discrimination that, that the Jewish people were experiencing. And, and again, we also, we can talk about Venice and the idea of the ghetto that's coming out of, uh, and we can talk about it. But what I'm trying to highlight here is that it's a European problem. It's the racism of Europe that created some form of necessity to consider having a Jewish identity that is to capitalize the idea of nationalism. That was kind of an emergent new idea. I mean, at the turn of the 20th century, there were more kingdoms and monarchies than there were republics, by the way, you know, for those who are, no one is that old, but I wanted to say, for those who remember that, no one remembers that. Um, but, so my point is that there were more monarchies and kingdoms than there were republics in the traditional sense. Now, why is that important? It's because the, the new idea of the nation state was trickling down to, to the rest of the world. And uh, when Theodor Herzl conceived of the idea, it was more or less a reaction to what happened uh, to the Jewish people in Europe. And I also want to highlight, this is a, a quote that I always like to use, Immanuel Kant. You know, Immanuel Kant, who in philosophy is a very well-known person for something called categorical imperative. Don't worry about that. Let's put that aside. So the interesting thing about Immanuel Kant is that he actually calls the Jewish people the Palestinian living among us. They have uh, garnered a reputation uh, that they are, uh, that they love money, obviously. It's a stereotype about Jewish people. So it was so ingrained in Europe, uh, the, the anti-Jewish sentiment was so ingrained that you know, the idea of Zionism was created. But the problem, by definition, is when you have a na nation, nationalism in general, 
it's exclusionary. So from the way I see, the way I define na the nationalism of, of Jewish nationalism, as also known as Zionism, is that it's an exclusionary ideology. It only has space for one particular people who identify as Jewish, period. Now, I mean, my point is, hypothetically, do I have a problem with somebody who wants to have their own nation state and exercise the quote unquote self-determination, the right of self-determination, the Wilsonian points if you want to. Hypothetically speaking, sure, I mean, you can go create your own state and whatever you want to do. But the problem is there were people there. There were people there, that's the problem is that when there were people there, settler colonialism is the only way you can actually be able to establish a state at the ruins of another people's existence. You, you, the erasure of identity. I mean, I cannot, there's so many records to show and so many pieces of evidence to show the sheer amount of destruction that the Palestinian existence had to endure. Okay, before 1948, after 1948, there's this, there's this, I mean again, the way I describe it typically is that it's a destruction of Palestinian society that took place in 1948, and it continues to happen. The fact that there are checkpoints and the wall, the apartheid wall that is built, it is in fact to continuously destroy Palestinian society. Um, to break down any connections within different communities within that society. So, so it's built on exclusion. It's built on demonization. It's built on uh, creating uh, an, more or less a non-safe space in your own country because of your identity. That's how I define Zionism. Yeah. Yeah, people like to paint Zionism in like shades of gray, but the reality is um, it is a racist, genocidal ideology that produced a racist, genocidal state. That's Zionism, in short. I'm just summar summarizing what you said. <laughs> but I want to say, but I want to add, I want to add, since Sid we're kind of in the mood of, I'll add a few things. Um, the, the early Zionist, now hear, hear me out here. The early Zionist hated nothing more than Jews. I'll say it again. The early Zionist hated nothing more than Jews. If you read what the founders of Zionism said about the Jews, okay, including things like a Zionist is the opposite of a Jew. They despise Jews. And when they envisioned a state or a colony, a European colony in, in Palestine, they envisioned it for secular European, uh, a small group of secular European Jews who were just unhappy because they couldn't join the equestrian clubs and they couldn't join the social clubs you know, in the countries where they, where, they, where they lived. But when you read what they wrote about the Jews, and the Jews were, the Jews who lived in the Pale of Settlement, you know, my, grand, you know, my you know, kind of working class, you know, pe people who lived in these Jewish communities, the shtetl and so on, who had beards, were religious people, you know, God-fearing people. Now, in the year 1900, in the year 1900, so Zionism was just, you know, getting started, right? The rabbis of you know, the famous rabbis of the, of the world got together and published a book. It was a book of essays. And basically, it was a warning for Jewish people from the dangers of Zionism. And they said three things, basically. And these are the most orthodox rabbis, this is, you know, most orthodox, you know, observant rabbis of the most observant communities, who, many of whom, by the way, are still anti-Zionist. And they said basically three things. First of all, they said Zionism will bring violence to the Holy Land. The idea of a Jewish state will bring violence to the Holy Land. The second thing they said was that it would ruin the good relations between Jews and Muslims and Jews and Arabs because there are Jewish communities throughout the Arab and Muslim world. And the third thing they said is it would cast doubt as to the loyalty of Jews in all the countries in which they live because Jews lived as a, Jewish, as a religious minority everywhere in the world. Now, Jews were always a religious minority. They were never seen as a nation like in the modern sense. The Zionists came and said, no, no, no. All this religious stuff is nonsense. We're a nation like everybody else. 
The Bible is our history book. It's not a religious book. Never mind the religious nonsense. You know what I mean? That's how they, it's kind of a mutation of reality. There's a very famous rabbi who lived in the 12th century in, in Baghdad. And his name was uh, uh, Sa'ad ibn Yusuf. In Hebrew, they call him something else. But anyway, he, he was a very important rabbi, and he's quoted, and his, the, work that he, the things that he wrote are observed you know, by, by Orthodox communities. And um, he said, a famous line where he said that the people of Israel are a nation united by its religious laws. He actually used the word sharia because he wrote in Arabic. That's it. People of Israel are a nation united by its religious laws. That's it. Not a nation, not a country, not a language, not a culture. That's why you could have a Polish Jew and a Yemeni Jew. They have nothing in common but their religious laws that they, that they observe. And that is what Judaism is. Zionism created a mutation, which was, like I said, a, a violent racist ideology that produced a violent racist state. No, no, no surprise there. So Zionism is actually a very, very simply, very, very clear um, uh, thing that we can identify. All these attempts to try to paint it in all different colors is complete nonsense. Um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a great podcast called Committing High Reason. And it's by a rabbi... Uh, committing high reason. It's he, he, It's by a very well-known Orthodox rabbi, who is the biggest, you know, the the expert on the difference between Judaism and and Zionism. And he wrote a book, actually, like a 1,500-page book called The Empty Wagon. But it's mostly he wrote it mostly to explain to Jews what Zionism really is. But it's a great resource because everything that there is to know about how racist and, and horrible the Zionists were and how far away they are um, and different they are from, from, from Judaism uh, is in that book. But in his, in his podcast, he interviews people and he speaks about all these different issues. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's, a really good, it's, it's a really good podcast. And yeah, so I, I would recommend that. I mean, the book is hard to read, like I said, because it's, re it's, it's written for, for, for Orthodox Jews who are used to studying the Talmud, which is all very complicated, sophisticated Jewish law. So it's not really kind of something that you read. Plus, like I said, it, it weighs a ton. But, but if you look at uh, Rabbi Shapiro, ya his name is Yaakov Shapiro. If you look at his stuff on YouTube, and so, you know, he's got great lecture speeches, and he speaks in front of Jewish communities, ultra-Orthodox communities. You know, when they have rallies, they'll have 30, 50,000 people at a rally. And he is the expert on, on how Zionism is, uh, is uh, an aberration. I mean, it's as far away as you could possibly be from, uh, from, from Judaism. Are they Masons? Huh? Are they Masons? Okay, great. Oh, this is an interesting one. Okay, this is for Miko. As an Israeli anti-Zionist, what is the typical response or reaction you get from Israeli Zionists upon hearing your ideas? That's actually that's actually a pretty good question. Huh? The the the. <laughs> it's always that. Uh, why did I have to go so far? It's like many many of them will say, you know what? I agree with you like ninety five percent. But why do you have to be so extreme? And I was thinking, you know, darn it, what is that 5%? If we could only identify that 5%. Well, that 5% is the willingness to see the other as equal. You know what I mean? Two-state solution is great. It's never going to happen. It's safe. It makes us look good. It makes us feel good when we talk about it. So it's a great, you know, it's, it's a great place to be if you want to be a little more, you still be as honest, but pretend that you're a little more progressive. Two-state solution is great. There's no risk. But why do I have to keep going and talk about equality and all that kind of stuff? So that's the most common response that I get. Why do I, you know, that I cross the line and uh, why do I have to be so, so, quite so extreme? I, I don't have an answer for that, though. <laughs> OK, this one is for Dr. Donna. As a professor, could you talk about your experience as a Palestinian professor and professor nonetheless during this time? Great. Thank you for that question. Um, <clears throat> I want to say that 
it hasn't always been friendly to Palestinians to be venturing through the academic space. Especially if you're doing social science-based type of research on Palestine, <laughs> that's what I do. So for me to, to, to venture into questions was um, that, that are not necessarily ones that see me in a positive light, that I'm trying to actually write a history that is against the grain writing new forms of history, writing the uh, Palestinian narrative in a new way, um, was always a problem. And you find that, actually this is the idea of, of, of narrative, right? Whose narrative matters and whose narrative doesn't matter. The academy is a very hostile place, I'm being honest with you, okay? It's an extremely hostile place. Um, if you are, and it's also, it's an extension of the status quo. It's an extremely conservative place, more or less, you know? Um, sure, you find new ideas emerging out of the academy, but that's a different story. The institution itself reinforces hierarchies in society. What do you think Harvard is? I mean, what do you think the idea of, of, of I mean, tenure, for example, for professors was a way for, you know, wealthy, mostly white men to say, oh, I've done enough for humanity and now I can do whatever the hell I want for the rest of my life, for example, right? And again, tenure now is a different concept um, that is, well, it's dying. It's a dying concept, I want to say. Um, so the academy is a very uh, traditional space that is not that hospitable to people that look like me or think like me. And increasingly so, you have to consider some of the, I mean, I, I, okay, okay, one thing I want to mention is that I found, found it quite difficult to find people help me and navigate those spaces. And I vowed to myself, I took a vow to myself, that when I quote unquote, I'm able to make it, if that's a word, when I make it, when I'm able to, when I have tenure and all that, I want to dedicate whatever time that I have to push forward people who are, who are willing and interested in moving forward, who, who need help. Particularly, and, and, I, and you know this if you've worked with me in the past, I particularly would like to help people who have no other possibilities of moving forward, especially women of color. Arab women, Muslim women, um, uh, women of color who have completely been neglected. I mean, the academy is so freaking bad for women, I cannot even begin to tell you how bad it is. A woman can, I mean, an academic woman, for example, who happens to be a woman, if she's pregnant, she has to think about what the hell am I going to do, when am I going to have the baby, maternity, paternity, it's horrendous. And I feel extremely privileged to have been a man dealing with this stuff and not a woman, unfortunately. So don't tell me that, there are, that these are equitable spaces. Even when it gets to gender, it's not equitable spaces. Okay, especially women of color. They don't have enough, and not only that, they're targeted. I mean, I'm talking about when you go to a conference and you happen to be a person of color, every single person who has anything ridiculous to say will come after you. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there you go, it's confirmed. <laughs> um, but it's, it's bad. Um, and the second part of the question, sorry I'm taking a little long, but I feel like it's important for you to know that it, it's, it's been an extremely difficult and also, you have to strategize and navigate terrible folks. I'm not going to mention names because I actually I finished my PhD from this institution. <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that. So, but, but, but I'm telling you, it was, I mean, that was a long time ago. Uh, but my point is, it's, it's very hard to navigate those spaces. Um, and you're targeted. And you're, you, you have to strategize, like, mm, how am I going to do this? How can I think about it? The second piece of the question, currently, this particular moment, um, you get targeted because of your identity. If you say anything, then all of a sudden, you know, whatever, they, I mean, someone who has zero knowledge about the question of Palestine, and I've written a ton of shit on it, excuse my language, okay? Sorry. I've really, <laughs> forgive me. <I'm> <laughs> okay. Um, so I've, I've, I've written a lot of stuff on it, right? And then next thing you know, someone who has zero knowledge about the topic says, no, you're wrong. Okay. All right, but how, what gives you that, I mean, what is your qualification to actually tell me that I'm incorrect about the, hun the, the hundreds of books that I had read to come out with that conclusion? 
And this is what I'm talking about, is that it becomes easy for, for if you are trying to push against the grain, okay, anything will be used against you. Anything will be used, will be weaponized against you, okay? I mean, I, I know that there are Persians and Iranians in the, in the audience. I totally, you know that. You know that quite well as well. I just, the reason why I do this, because I, I know specific examples that have happened. So, um, so yeah, it's not a great place. But at the same time, it is a place. It's, it's a way for us to present uh, alternative uh, narratives that are more accurate, that actually reflect reality, um, and to actually challenge the status quo. That is very powerful. When you're able to write a book that will change how people see specific things, that has power to it. Um, anyway, as I said in my talk, I mean, sometimes I feel like maybe I shouldn't have taken this path, but too, too late at this point. Anyway, so there, that's my answer to your question. Okay, um, we have 10 minutes left, and this is a pretty big question. What do you think the fall of the apartheid state will look like? Is it gonna be internal political tension? Uh, the US abandoning Israel out of political pressure? Will it look like grassroots organizing? What do you think it's gonna look like? I, nobody knows what it's going to look like, but I think we have a pretty good model if we follow what happened with South Africa. And what happened in South Africa as a result of, um, you know, very courageous people, like many of the people in this room, standing up and making demands and being, making uncompromising demands and standing, you know, standing firm. The apartheid regime well, the, the, the apartheid regime had nowhere to go. They were on their knees. I said that earlier. They were on their knees. They had nowhere to go. It was done. You couldn't, it's not just that you couldn't go to an event in South Africa. You, if you organized an event, whether it's academic or athletic or whatever, if you invited a, a South African delegation, you would be penalized. Yep. It was illegal. That's the level of, 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 of seriousness. That's the level of sanctions and, and divestment that, and boycott they were talking about. So then a uh, South African president stood up one day and said, they're calling for one person, one vote elections, releasing all the political prisoners, including a very famous one by the name of Nelson Mandela, and unbanning all the political parties. That was the end of apartheid. Now, I, I can see that happening in Palestine. Okay, now if we, you know, get off our backsides and get to work, we, it'll happen sooner rather than later. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to come from heaven. We, we're going to have to do it. But if we, you know, do, you know, work hard and fast, then it can happen sooner rather than later. And then it could even be this guy who's, who's the prime minister right now standing up and doing it. You never know. He's been around for so long, he's, it's not very likely that he's going anywhere. So it may well be him. But the point is, it doesn't matter. That'll be, now, what I think is really important to clarify is the end of apartheid, that's base camp. That's, that's just the beginning. That's just creating a, a level playing field. Now you need to have elections. Now you have to have political parties. Now you have to create uh, voting districts. The country doesn't have voting districts. Even within 1948 Palestine, where Israelis vote, there are no vote. You know, so I mean, there's, you, they have to create a constitution. You have to have a House of Representatives, you have to have an executive, and then you have to build this thing. And then you have to put, put in mechanisms that will allow the refugees to return. You know, the right of return has become a bumper sticker, but it's very dangerous. It should not be a bumper sticker. It's not, it's not a slogan. The right of return, we need to be thinking of the mechanisms that will be put in place to allow the refugees to return. And on and on and on. But that is how, that's how it happens. This is what happens. You know, in some countries, you have massive civil war. In other countries, like I said, in South Africa, they, they you know, they, they figured out, out how to do it without blood, or almost no bloodshed. 
And so uh, my, if I was to make a forecast, I would, I, would assume, I would suggest that that is the model that we would follow in Palestine too, that this is, these are the steps that will, that will, um, that will be taken. And then um, the advantage that Palestine has over many of the other countries that went through similar transformations, but certainly a huge advantage over South Africa. You know, in South Africa, they had 30 or 40 million impoverished black Africans who were never given the opportunity to go to school, who couldn't read and write. That doesn't exist in Palestine. The only reason there's, there's you know, Palestinians are impoverished is because of the economics of apartheid. So you basically have two societies that can develop, that can create a functioning democracy the next day, you know? Now, are some people gonna to wanna to pick up a gun and kill? Of course, mostly the Zionists. But I would venture to say that most people, will prob but picking up a gun and killing someone is a choice. I would venture to say that most people would opt to create a reality where they can get up in the morning, send their kids to school and go to work. You know, because that's what I think most people want. So I, I foresee that that is, that is, but I think clearly outside pressure is what is needed. We can't rely, don't wait for Israelis for the Israeli society. They're gonna do what they're gonna do. Outside pressure, severe sanctions, severe boycott, denying Israel the right to, go, to be part of the Olympics and to, you know, World Cup. I mean, academic institutions, they have to be completely, completely, um, f no, zero tolerance. And that's, and, and, that's, and that's what we'll do it. So I believe that's gonna be the, the that, I think it's a good roadmap. It's obviously very hard to predict what can and cannot happen, but um, I, I agree in the sense that external pressure will be significant, if not the primary reason as to why the end of the already existing apartheid regime would, would collapse. Um, BDS did not come out of nowhere. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions did not come out of nowhere. It was effectively the uh, civil rights uh, leaders in Palestine who recognized that after the 2002, April in particular, 2002 uh, incursion, Israeli incursion into Palestinian cities with tanks and destruction. That was kind of somewhat, and I'm not saying that, like, unfortunately the, the violence against Palestinians has increased dramatically over the years. But 2002 was somewhat a new form of, of violence that didn't particularly exist a few years prior to that against Palestinians, whereby you had literally tanks blowing up apartment, it, it was ridiculous, in the streets, right? Um, that, in a sense, provided some of those leaders with the idea that we cannot, quote unquote, win if it's a one-on-one -on -one geography type of a battle, if that makes sense. We're never gonna win, Palestinians would never win. So they felt that they, in a sense, to quote unquote internationalize or ex ex kind of push, push it towards outside of Palestine. This isn't the first time this idea came around. The Marxist, obviously, the PFLP, DFLP, Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, uh, Hizb Shab, a bunch of other organizations that really focused around, um, around Marxism and around uh, the, the, the fight against the bourgeois class. And again, the idea, you see the struggle of Palestinians as one that is similar to the struggle of other colonized people. But, right. The interesting thing, though, is that this is a bit different. It's different in the sense that it was out of necessity and, and it, was, um, it was also relying on new groups of, as I mentioned earlier, transnational networks of Palestinians that live external to Palestine. So that became a strength of sorts. So BDS laws, BDS, uh, you know, uh, BDS uh, resolutions on campuses, for example, um, uh, at, at city councils, et cetera, they're really increasing over time. And the idea of boycotting companies that are implicit in human rights violation are increasing, they're on the rise. So BDS as a, as a strategy seems to have worked quite well. And I also wanna mention that like when Palestinians are thinking about their future, they're thinking honestly, like first and foremost, the idea of equality. How can we be equal? If 1967, as I mentioned earlier, if in 1967, you probably know this better than me, but I, you probably know the internal issues of this. But in, 19, in 1967, had Israel 
just say, oh, you know what, let's give everybody full citizenship rights. Of course, that would be the, the complete destruction of, of the idea of Zionism. Do you think we're going to have this problem today? Of course not. The idea is about, the idea is about exclusion. In 1987, 20 years after the occupation of, of 1967, right, the, the, the first intifada broke out. It's not it, out of nowhere. I mean, there was a traffic accident, you know, an, in Gaza that took place. We know that. We know the incident itself. But it wasn't itself in, in by itself. It was basically the straw that broke the camel's back, right? And effectively creating a new level of complete and utter, um, I mean, you know, uh, in a sense, the Intifada was a revolution, right? It's a revolution against the occupier. We've tried this damn thing called occupation for 20 years, all right? And also, one of the slogans back then was, Raghiful khubzi la yakfi. What does that mean? A loaf of bread isn't enough, implying that economic injustice is not the only reason why people fight against colonialism. It's about political rights. It's about political rights. So if you think about this, um, I mean, typically the argument like, oh, well, Palestinians have jobs inside Israel, and that gives them some economic benefit. But maybe that's, you know, maybe they get to eat a loaf of bread, but that does not solve the problem of political rights. People need equality, and Palestinians deserve equality. The end of the apartheid regime would be when everyone that lives between the river and the sea have the same damn color of an ID and the same damn citizenship. <laughs> I'm so glad that this was such a fruitful discussion and I hope that we were able to get through enough of your questions. I do just want to quickly end off, we really don't have any time left, but I think that this could be valuable. Do you have a message to offer to the students on our campus right now that have set up an encampment um, to push the UW to divest? Liberation zones. Liberation, liberation zones, sorry. Yeah, they call them liberation zones. Well, I think I think this whole ev this whole evening was dedicated to the students in the in the lib liberated zones. I think that's what this is about. This was dedicated to, to to them that are still out there that are not here. To those of you that are here, this is all for you. This is all about you. We, I think we are in, inspired and indebted to you and your courage. And I I suspect very strongly that you are going to win. We are all going to win. Palestine is going to win, thanks to you. So keep it up and, um, and let's, um, let's, let's do this, yeah. So liberation um, is at the center of how people ought to think um, in terms of, you know, the current situation on campuses is one that really brings about how um, how we as a people have to come around an idea, the idea of liberation, the idea of understanding that systems of oppression are there to oppress and to push against the status quo um, in any way possible, right? Um, and to create, uh, ultimately, that it, it's a great the idea that people have to live equally. That's all I would have to say. Um, and I wish them, um, I mean, th these liberated zones are a reflection of courage. And as we know, campuses are places where people have uh, differing views. And campuses are where, where the conversations are to be had. And campuses are where people stand against the status quo. I mean, we know that. We know that throughout history. And it's not only in the United States. This is, this is, pretty much universal. So uh, we, we need to look at this movement as a way to rethink how we are, uh, how we frame the issue of, of uh, equality, frame the issue of social justice, uh, because Palestine, as, whether you like it or not, is at the center of social justice globally. And we've all, a lot of us knew that a hell of a long time ago. People are just discovering it now. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much to our amazing speakers. Can they all get um, a very generous last round of applause, please? And also, thank you so much to UW's amazing MSA for putting on this 
really well-coordinated event. You all did so fantastic. Thank you.